uh, I am going to get the meeting started. Uh, the reason I'm starting the meeting is that the first order of business is to call to order and reorganize. So I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.34. And uh, this, about half an hour ago, the Pelham School Committee reorganized, which was the last step we needed to then bring reorganization to the regional level. And so my only role will be to facilitate a vote for chair of the region, and then the ch chair of the region will then facilitate the votes for vice chair and secretary uh, of the region, and then we can get to the order of business on the agenda. So um, unless there's questions about it, if there are any nominations for chair of the regional school committee? So Mr. Menino? I nominate Eric. Is there a second? Second. And would that be nomination be agreeable? Sure. Thank you. Are there other nominations that people would like to make? Seeing none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that passed unanimously, I think. I'm going to abstain. Okay, uh, opposed and abstentions. So 401 for that vote, and I pass the lifeboat gavel to you. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you to the committee. I uh, look forward to a good year. Uh, we have a busy evening, so I'm going to dispense with the formalities of that and move on to uh, the role of vice chair. Are there any nominations for vice chair? I recognize myself. Uh, I nominate Allison McDonald. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any, you, is that amenable? I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I realize yeah. it's a lot to put on you uh, at the moment. Uh, great. Any further nominations? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of uh, Austin McDonald as vice chair, raise your hand. Any nays? Any abstentions? It's 401. You are the vice chair. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm busy. I gotta, I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the, the third nomination is for secretary. Traditionally, this is a role that's been played by Deb Westmoreland. Uh, we still need a nominator? We do. Anyone want to nominate Deb? I nominate, I nominate, oh, go ahead. I nominate Deb Westmoreland for a secretary. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, is that amenable? Okay, all those in favor, please signify that. There's an hand. Uh, it... Uh, uh, all those in favor? Okay, so Deb's got it. Unanimous. This one's unanimous, by the way. Because you don't get a chance to vote against <laughs> the uh, Wonderful. So th with the reorganization finished, uh, we'll move forward with our agenda. Uh, the next item in the agenda is approval of the minutes of May 28th, 2019. Hopefully people have had a chance to take a look at them. Yes. Um, I note one edit um, in the public comment section. Mm -hmm. Lisa Kane is noted as speaking about lacrosse. Um, I believe she was speaking about field hockey. Okay. Have an amendment. Just going to wait to make sure that has it. Good. Take that as a yes. Uh, anything else? Move to accept. It's been moved to approve the minutes uh, of May 28th. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion, edits, debates? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of May 28th, signify by raising your hand. Any nays? Any abstentions? It is now 501 and it is, are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item in the agenda is announcements and public comments. Are there any announcements from the school committee? Mr. Dumbling. Uh, so I was able to attend the Board of Education uh, meeting this morning at, at which the board voted to support the commissioner's decision not to approve the expansion request for mm -hmm. PVC ICS Charter School. So I just want to say a quick thank you to uh, Chair Sarah Hall from uh, Pelham School Committee who spoke very well uh, at public comment this morning as did Molly Burnham from Northampton School Committee. I also want to thank all the members of the public and our public representatives who worked on this over the last number of months. There was a number of emails, there was a rally. Um, so Senator Comerford, Representative Dome, Representative uh, Sabadosa, um, and, and all the members of the public who uh, wrote an email, shared, uh, got other people activated, not only to notify the commissioner, but to notify the board after the appeal. It's a long process. This is our third year in a row. So we've had six calls for action. Uh, and I, I think it. I think it matters. I think. I think um, 
you know, without getting into the mind of the board, I think when they know that people are paying attention in an informed, sustained way, uh, it makes it a lot harder for them to make irresponsible decisions. Not impossible, but I think it makes it a lot harder. So I would, um, you know, going forward, who knows what the, the cards may bring, but I, I, I would just echo Ms. Ordonez's uh, advice to the class of 2019 from graduation a couple of weeks ago, which is stay loud. Yeah. And your, your reward for being loud is to be louder, and I'm sure there will be opportunity in the future. Yes. Thank you very much. Sminina. The letter written in support was coaching, compelling, and wonderful. Period. That is true. Uh, OK, any further announcements from the school committee? Seeing none, uh, we'll move to public comments. Um, the, uh, I'm also just going to say sort of at the outset that um, I know later during the athletic fields updates, I know this is a matter of great concern for many people in the public, um, Dr. Morris is going to talk about, since this is our last meeting of the year, he's going to talk about what the follow-up will be during the summer in terms of public engagement. And I'm saying that because since we're going to have the uh, public comment at the beginning and then the update about where we are and then move forward our agenda, because as you can see, we have a lot of things on it. Um, in no way does that end the, the public engagement around this. In fact, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be significant public engagement, including opportunities both to uh, keep uh, the, the town and the school district's feet to the fire around the quality of the athletic fields, but also literally to participate in that process. And so I'm, just, I'm saying that now at the outset, because when you look at the agenda, I can understand why people would say, look, you have public comment at the beginning, you have the agenda item, then you move forward. When do we have a chance to engage? And I'm hopeful that the superintendent, and if, by the way, if he doesn't, I'm going to press him to, um, will describe in detail how you can be engaged further afterwards this meeting, because it's not the end. It's a continuous process and an ongoing one. But we know there's a great deal of interest in that topic, as well as, uh, I'm sure, others. Uh, we have the timer up simply because, as you may recall, uh, the, the request is to come forward. You have three minutes. Identify yourself. You have three minutes to speak, uh, and uh, we will uh, get going with public comment. So please just come forward and uh, uh, come to the microphone if you have any comments. Hi, my name is. Can I turn it on, or is it doing? My name is Heather Sheldon, and I'm... Just one second. Is it working? Yep. Amherst Media? Sorry. Um, wanted to read this statement on behalf of Catherine Lodge, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, she says, my daughter Caitlin O'Connor's graduation has me thinking about how much I appreciate Dr. Brady. Ms. Smith and the entire special education staff. As you know, Caitlin is severely disabled, both physically and intellectually. Caitlin has been enrolled in the Amherst school system since she turned two years, nine months old. The special education department, especially as Caitlin has grown older, has been exceptionally supportive in striving to meet Caitlin's needs. As a parent, I appreciate the special education department's collaborative and cooperative efforts. I've heard stories from parents of special education students in other districts and their struggles in dealing with their school systems. I am thankful that has not been my experience here in Amherst. When issues have arisen, Dr. Brady has always immediately responded to my concerns, often late at night or on the weekends. The past few years, I have been involved in the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. I have seen Dr. Brady's commitment to increasing the school district accessibility to all. Dr. Brady works with CPAC to educate parents and guardians on topics such as basic rights and special education, assistive technology workshops, creating autism awareness events, supporting mental health workshops, and is open to any suggestion CPAC has with regards to workshops. CPAC members are invited to help interview potential teaching and support staff. Also, annually CPAC members meet with Sean Mangano to discuss a special education budget and give feedback about spending plans. In closing, I would like to again thank the entire special education staff for everything they do. Sincerely, Catherine Lodge. And I, you know, Catherine's at sort of the other end of um, her experience with working with the special education. Um, I have a rising third grader who also has um, significant special needs. And I want to say my experience has also been very similar to Catherine's. And I wanted to thank the school committee and the superintendent um, for supporting our special education staff as they support our children. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comments? I have a 
are we not having comments when we discuss fields? I might have missed it. Yes. So we're yeah. not having comments, or we are? Not during the item. So if, really, if you have comments, the comments should come now. Absolutely. And, and we're welcoming them, and, that, and that's why I said at the beginning okay, yeah. the point that the superintendent's going to discuss how to engage after the meeting with what's presented. Okay. Uh, my name's Chris Ehorn, Jr. I'm the head football coach for Amherst Regional High School. Um, I came here, I'm a strong supporter in us building an athletic stadium uh, that is for all sports who use stadiums. I think it's important because it, one, shows a little pride in our school. It's a place for the town to go to, whether it's Friday nights for football games or any other time for any other sport. The town I come from, Friday nights are a big deal. Going to the stadium is a big deal to support the school that they love. And I think it's important that we have something like that. Um, in regards to the fields, considering maybe the old school thought of I love muddy fields for football, it's just fun that way. At the same time, I understand there's a need for it to be usable for everybody. Um, I, I see comments of, or what we'll discuss is, uh, what's the protocol to determine how many groups use the field that are in poor condition? How can this be improved? I don't think the answer is cutting um, sports using fields. I don't think it's, the answer is limiting the use of fields. Uh, it's important that they're on the fields using them. Like, where would we rather have them be? Right? If we're on a field together, that means we're growing a bond, we're learning responsibility, we're practicing hard work, and if we're, either it's, if we're cutting it, I think that's a big problem. Um, I think the issue is we're not maintaining the fields. It has nothing to do with who's using them. They haven't been maintained, the track hasn't been maintained, so I don't want to negatively affect any sport and not have them practice or play games because we cannot maintain these fields. Uh, it's not the kid's fault. They shouldn't be punished for us and our inaction over decades. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to further public comments at this time. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, my name is Michelle Risch. I am the uh, varsity field hockey coach and varsity softball coach here at Amherst High School. And um, I am a teacher at the Amherst Montessori School um, in uh, South Amherst. I have been involved in coaching at the school since 2006. Um, and over that period of time, I've seen uh, the ebb and flow of interest from the kids um, interest from the administration as the administration has ebbed and flowed um, and interest in sports in general in the town of Amherst. What has remained constant is that kids come out to play sports every year um, as a way to uh, better themselves, have a safe place to be, engage in community, um, and learn the skills of not only being an athlete, but of growing into the best human that they can be. So with that said, I think it's incumbent upon those of us that are in charge of and responsible for them um, and the sports that, that we coach and, and the sports that we support, and that should be all of them, um, to make strong, strong efforts to finally resolve what has been a long-term ongoing issue with the fields in general. Um, the middle school fields and the high school fields, fields excuse me, they're linked. Um, we have enough sporting programs during each season, the spring and the fall seasons, when we're outside, that we need all of the fields that we use, even as the, the population has ebbed and flowed. It doesn't matter. If you have a team, you have a team and you need the field. So if the, field, the team is small that year or if the team is big that year, it doesn't matter. You need the fields. Um, so first and foremost, I want to be understood as somebody standing up here um, in favor of the children and the fields. Then I'm going to take uh, one step further and say, as the field hockey coach, 
I'm well aware of the kind of surface that is necessary to play field hockey on, to be safe, to be competitive, to continue to grow our program that was 0-17 four years ago and has made the playoffs two years in a row now. Um, the surface needs to be smooth and the grass needs to be short. And I understand that uh, there are a lot of field options out there. Um, I am looking for an immediate solution so that we're on a good, playable, safe field in September. And I, in no way, shape, or form, would want that to overrule or push aside the longer-term solution. So I, I intend on staying engaged in the conversation, and I've been following the conversation. Um, and so I just, speaking to this important body, want you to know that I'm going to be speaking to two sides of the issue. One is finding a safe, solid field for September, and two, finding a long-term solution. And I look forward to hearing what's coming from you in your report later. Thank you. thank you for my extra 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Any further public comments? My name is Carol Samuels. I'm the former field hockey coach and the current uh, varsity lacrosse coach. I've uh, worked, uh, just completed my 15th year here at Amherst. And um, I just want to uh, sort of paint a big picture to be sure that we're all on the same page, that um, athletics at a school are um, co-curricular. They're not extracurricular. And therefore, they need to be treated that way, prioritized that way, and funded that way. Um, and so with that bi big picture in mind, the details need to be sorted out. I haven't always felt uh, that the town uh, prioritizes athletics in a way that respects their kid, their own kids, um, or other people's children. Uh, and, and so I, I'm hoping to that that this the group that's going to be charged with solving this um, can help change the sport culture in, Amher in Amherst. And you have great pockets of excellent sport culture, but uh, but as a town, I'm not sure we've done a good job selling the importance to youngsters of, of what sport, um, the value that sport brings and teaches. Um, this is my 40th year coaching, so I've been at a couple of different schools, um, and, and I have you know, just spent that time uh, really building culture within a team, but also outside of the team. So I feel comfortable with my parental support, but overall, the support needs to be, uh, keep in mind that this is a co-curricular and it would be like, you know, not having your math book. And that would not be acceptable to anybody in this town. And yet when our lacrosse program come, you know, we don't day to day didn't know where we were going to be able to practice, let alone play. Um, you know, that, that's just, it, it's rough and it was exhausting. Um, and just to, you know, I'm reading what's in there, there, you know, I would have liked a few more details about that. We, we played on the middle school field. We had four varsity competitions on an 80-yard field, not even a legal field. Um, and it's, it's not fair to those girls that come out and work every day um, to be the best that they can be. And it's not fair to our opponents who do the same thing and come and play on a, on a subpar uh, field, um, and so that that's the canvas that we paint our educational picture on, and I'm I'm hoping we can uh, change the culture and and get the support behind it. Thank you. Further comments? I wasn't going to, but I'm an inspired coach. I submit some documents. Okay. Uh, there's a stack of them. I want to talk about. I'm Stuart Shulman. You probably remember me from last time. I'm not going to ask for extra time today. Page three talks, it's, a, it's on 100,000 websites. Field and area safety. It's really the thing that lights my fuse here, right? Field and area safety. Um, because if you don't take care of the field, it's not just that the game doesn't play right, it's that people can get hurt badly. 
right? Which is why I made a public document request about injuries and other things today to the town, among a series of other things. But if you look at page four, this is the rock that came out of the middle school field this week. This week, when you played those four games there, this rock was on that field, right? And I dug it out. Uh, it's not my job to dig out rocks in your fields. This could have killed a student. All right? You fall at the wrong angle, you hit your head on this rock, and you're dead. That's my public comment. Uh, I could say a lot about Fort River. I don't even know if that's in your domain. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, please. Further, further public comment. I also didn't expect to speak, but I guess I'll speak. I'm Michael Rudd. Uh, we met last time. I'm the soccer coach over at the high school. I just wanted to say that that rock that he took out is a field from a field that I'm going to be coaching on next week. We're not just talking about high school or middle school people. I'm working with five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. Again, a matter of safety. Why do I, as a coach, have to, have to go through that field um, step by step to figure out if this thing's going to be safe enough to risk the health and sometimes the life of these little kids, let alone my high schoolers who are playing summer soccer there. You know, I've already, I was, happened to be at that game when Stu sent that photo later on. My players must have run over it 15, 20 times, not to mention the other team as well. A couple more concrete things. Um, every season now for who knows how many number of years, there's been a time before, during, or after a game where we have found a sinkhole created by um, a sprinkler system. The holes have been as deep as a foot, foot and a half. Sometimes the pipes are sticking up. You know, obviously a safety hazard. Um, I also want to speak next about the football program. Football has been nothing but gracious to soccer, allowing us to practice side by side, um, being helpful whenever they can. When we pulled off our field because it was unplayable and unsafe, we essentially made football unsafe. We muddied that field. We made it, we made it unplayable. And so this is what happens. It, one thing feeds off, to the, off the next. And I'll say the last thing is that if I had a player, a son, who I thought would go on to college and possibly earn some money because of his soccer and his, his, his academic prowess, I would think twice before sending him out to play on this team. Um, there's one over there who has a chance to play in college. There are several others on our team who have a chance to play, and some of them need some money, or would they, it would be a, a less of a burden on their families. Um, so the ramifications of this is clear. It's not just soccer or field hockey or football wanting a better space. We're also thinking about the future of our kids from the five and six year olds that I have to deal with next week to the 18 year olds that are sitting around here. Something to think about, thank you. Thank you very much. So if we have any further public comments, we'll take them, otherwise we'll close public comments. And, oh, please. Hello, Jack Nagy. I'm a student athlete here at Amherst Regional High School. I'll be a senior next year. Um, I play both uh, football as well as lacrosse, and I do indoor track as well, so I'm competing constantly throughout the year. And, you know, I just wanted to say that while, while we're figuring out a solution for this issue, which is clear, um, we need to consider both the long term and the short term. We need to make sure that the fields are able to be played on during this fall as well as this spring, and then, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years down in the future. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. With that, with that, we're going to close public comment. Um, thank you very much for everyone's comments. The next item on our agenda is subcommittee updates. This is a self-reporting system. So if you're on a <laughs> subcommittee with a report, uh, raise your hand and uh, you can make it. Cool, we'll move on. Uh, we do need to appoint a summer warrant signing committee. Remind me how many people that needs to have on it? If it's 
Three, I believe. Three, okay. Um, three from Amherst, that's particularly helpful because it resolves another <laughs> group's interest. Okay. Spitzer? I'm happy to volunteer. Okay. Shadama? You're happy to volunteer? I am happy to volunteer. Okay. Are you happy to volunteer? As needed. Can we have four? <laughs> that doesn't give us. That gives us. And we'll have four because that way that, that, that gives us one, somebody a liberty to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a nice thing to do. Okay, then so that is done. Uh, we'll move forward with superintendent update. Is there a uh, special sheet yes. of paper or something? Yes. Come around. Okay. So I'll be very brief. Um, we had a very successful end of the school year. Uh, many of you were able to make it to the high school graduation, which was a wonderful event. Um, we live streamed it. It was neat to see that they do give you a link of where people were watching it. There are 28 states and five or six countries around the world where family members and friends were able to see their um, see our students walk across the stage. And the entire ceremony was the live streaming. Then they make a high quality, high def YouTube clip. Um, so there's a very long hyperlink, but if you also just Google Amherst Regional High School Graduation 2019, it'll come up as your first tip. Um, also on June 10th, we had a very uh, uh, one of my favorite events of the year, which was to recognize our district's employees who have reached milestone years of service so that um, and retiring. So those are 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. And we had a 40-year employee that we recognized. Um, we had over 100 people there, uh, including family members and friends. and um, we don't do that enough to thank our staff members who work with our children every day, and it's a really nice opportunity. Uh, the middle school grade span advisory board, so thank you to Ms. McDonald and Ms. Cunningham for their update on that, and certainly that'll be a topic when we get to FY20 planning that we'll want to have on the agenda. And the last set of documents was just, um, I know there were some questions <coughs> that I received, and Dr. Brady created a memorandum just about out of district, special education out of district placements and other folks who come in to support us in that way. So I'm not going to go through that, but if there's any questions, any committee member can certainly follow up with me directly. Okay, so you'll welcome feedback afterwards. Right, sir, are there any questions for the superintendent regarding his update? I have a quick one. Yes, yeah, so I'm just curious how we're doing with our um, summer lunch, breakfast and lunch program. Because I know last year we were able to do 11 sites. And I'm just curious with the transition we're going through, if we're still able to do more than just the middle school. We are. We're maintaining the same level of sites that we did last year. Um, and Ms. Palmer, her last week is this week. Um, but she, uh, we and Mr. Mangano has been critically helpful um, in organizing kind of who will assist in that. And that's up and running right now. And so we're ma we didn't add, which was one of our ideas, but we were maintaining the same uh, number of sites that we had last year. Thank you. Great. Any further questions with the superintendent? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Um, there's no chairs report. Although one thing I'll bring up is that I talked about um, months ago is that after this meeting, sort of we don't have any meetings for a while, and uh, over the summer I'm going to work with the superintendent and Mr. Mangano to dig back <coughs> into the sort of regional assessment thing in anticipation of the next year. Because a little bit like the issue Mr. Demling talked about during announcements, this is a... Uh, a topic that never seems to resolve itself, <laughs> uh, no matter how hard we try. So I just thought people should know, because also if you're interested in learning about or engaging or sitting down with myself and Sean and Mike over the summer, just drop us a line, and it's not a secret. They're not secret meetings. We're happy to have you join us and be involved in that process. Um, <clears throat> so moving into new and continuing business, the athletic fields update is the first item on the agenda. And I guess I'd just say, I mean, this is something that, understandably there's deep and, and, and passionate concern about, but also extraordinarily practical concern, right? I mean, we want fields that are playable and are safe. Uh, and I think that given the discussion from the last uh, meeting and just a lot of the communication we've had, I think there's a heightened sense of need to understand what the path forward is, how also to build trust around uh, what kind of preparations are gonna be taken between now and the fall. Um, there's also been an offer multiple times for people to want to engage to help in some way. And so I'm just sort of saying at the outset, I'm um, both the superintendent as a guest to uh, uh, Mr. Mooring, who's in back, uh, and others that um, what I'm hoping, I'm just saying it now, because I can say it later, but I'm gonna say it now, that when I'm hoping in whatever presentation we get, that, we, that one of the things that occurs, apart from any sort of sense of what the direction is, 
is there's a clear sense for the members of the audience and the public who are watching about how they can, if they want to be engaged, how they can be engaged in following up, both in terms of learning about the efficacy of this new approach to, to managing and maintaining the fields, um, what actually gets done this summer, and then also if they can help, how they can build that relationship to help. And I figured, I mean, you, probably all of that is going to be in your presentation, but I'm just saying it now that if it isn't, that's the, literally the first question I'm going to ask. I'll recognize myself and I'll ask that question. Um, and I'm sure everyone, every other member of the committee, I'm sure has the same question and concern. Yeah. So I just wanted to lay that out uh, in advance and yeah. hand it over to you and any other guests that you may be having in, in this conversation. Sure. So uh, before I do that in the introduction of guests, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate people for coming out tonight. It's an issue that's certainly critical for many of our student athletes and families and coaches. It's certainly, I think as I shared the last time, something that's near and dear to my heart in terms of how my life was influenced by being both a high school and collegiate athlete, a student athlete. And so um, I want to recognize the urgency of the situation and also just appreciate people's advocacy on the issue. Um, so uh, one thing to know, there's kind of multiple things to start just as a framing. So in the packet tonight, there's an update that's about six or seven pages long that was completed by Mr. Farrow. Uh, and the reason I want to start that place is Mr. Farrow has opted to return to his prior position, which was a science teacher at Amherst Regional Middle School, uh, and not return to his athletic director role for next year. So um, he worked on this document. I want to publicly acknowledge his work on this topic this spring. Um, also to note that we will be um, posting this week uh, for the role of athletic director. And so I will do my best to be able to represent um, and not his, he has a higher level of knowledge of field than I do. He happens to be away this week, otherwise he would be here even though his, he's transitioning to a different role. Um, I also want to acknowledge Dave Zolmick, who was in the back. It's right here. Oh, there you are. Sorry, Dave. So uh, on our website, and it's been up since Friday, was about a 50-some-odd page report with about 20 page of appendices, which is the Athletic Facility Strategic Plan report provide, um, prepared by Wesson and Sampson. So I want to thank Mr. Zolmick for shepherding that process and pushing the consultants to get us uh, a report at the end um, that I think has really meaning. And for people who don't want to read the 50 some odd pages, the executive summary, which starts on page three, is really helpful. And that's on our website right now. Uh, Mr. Mooring, Gilford Mooring is our superintendent of public works in the back of the room. I'm going to invite him up in a little bit to talk about some of the work that's happened in the last month as well as what's being planned for fall. He can describe it in much more detail than I can. Um, and I really want to thank Gene Jones, who hasn't even started as principal yet, but is joining us tonight. So thank you, the principal of the high school, for coming. We talked a little earlier today. It was an interest. He, uh, he had showed an interest in coming and um, interest in hearing from the community and what the plan was for the field. So thank you, Mr. Jones, for being here. All that being said, um, so I think uh, I'm going to go through what's in the packet, but I do want to start with some of the executive summary from the longer consultant report. We'll come back to this. This is uh, most of the work in the Western and Sam's report is long-range planning. I think the student at the end nailed it, which is we have to have a plan for the fall and spring, and then we also have to have a long-term plan. And most of the Western and Sampson looks at the long-term plan. But they did do a very thorough analysis of use of our fields and condition of our fields that I think it's sometimes useful to have an external person come in and say, you know, what is the condition, not from people who take care of it every day, but someone who looks at fields as, as their vocation. And one of the, a couple of points that I want to reference that they, um, they I'm just going to read from their executive summary. Usage levels of the fields were recorded at 150 recommended percent, the recommended levels for maintaining facilities in a good state of repair. Uh, and they have a lot more data in there. Over 3,000 participants used the fields. They did um, some survey tracking of LSSC, youth organizations, high school athletics, everyone who uses the athletic fields. And that's the formal use. That's not the informal use of kids who want to play a game of soccer on their own and they happen to go to the field after school, which we want. We want students being our athlete, um, using our fields. We want them being physically active. Um, they also said, and again, I'll just read direct quote, there are not enough playing venues to meet current use demands. So one of the challenges we're having is we're overusing the fields and it's coming from a place of we don't have enough fields to meet the demands of the community um, who is using it. And that's not only the schools. That's, that's they, one of the appendices they describe all the different use, or many of the different users of our fields. Um, and they also spoke about a lack of a clear, concise, and evenly enforced field use policy. So in summary of some of their, their analysis, we have structural issues with the fields, which they detail, and Rich detailed a bit in this report. We have an overuse 
issue, which is, comp which is comp uh, complicated by uh, a lack of clear management planning of how to control the use. Uh, we have funding issues in terms of the maintenance. Um, and so what we tried to do, and by we, I'm really referring to the town staff as well as school staff, is uh, really to get at what can we do for fall, how can we improve the playing conditions, uh, both for safety and for competition, um, to reduce the overuse of the field as well as maintain them better. And then the future conversation is what is the long-term vision and what are the town's willingness to, frankly, pay for increasing field use. One of the things I thought was interesting that I heard feedback from uh, a couple other towns is that, and it's sort of in the Weston and Samson report, but I'll put a finer point on it, is uh, expectations for fields have also changed in the last 30 years. So even if the fields weren't deteriorating, which they are, the expectations of what a high-quality field was in 1980-something is different than it is in 2019, and that's a good thing. Uh, the challenge is that our fields have not maintained uh, or risen, let alone risen to the challenge, they have not maintained their current condition given the uh, chronic overuse as well as poor planning and poor quality of the fields. And I'm not only referring to, and this study didn't just look at the athletic fields at the high school, it looked at Plum Brook, it looked all over town. So it's, it's looking holistically of where are other places that we could play because we know our high school athletes, student athletes, do utilize fields from time to time that are not on the high school proper. So for instance, the one on Stanley Street, which I'm going to blank on the name of, Kiwanis. Yeah. Park, that gets used by Ultimate and that gets used by other sports. And um, so we do have a very complicated and um, challenging situation, um, which is no less complicated by some feedback we've already see received, I've already received from member towns, and their willingness to engage on um, the funding of repairing, replacing fields. Uh, we're one of uh, a minority of communities in our local area that are similarly sized that have not, do not have a turf field right now. So most communities in the last 15, 20 years have invested in a turf field, which overuse becomes much less of a problem, um, field rotation becomes much less of a problem. Uh, but the reality is we don't have a turf field. We're not going to have it for fall. We're not going to have it for next spring. And so we need to plan for that uh, both short term and long term. Sorry to do all these introductory comments, but I want to help set the context of what we learned from an external um, source who's ex who are experts on this uh, to guide what are we going to do now. So I'll go through the update, which is in the packet. I'll try to summarize that. I'll try not to read from it. But what the team tried to do is take a look at what were the questions we heard either from public comment or from the committee mem from committee members last time that we can respond to, and what did we learn from the Wesson and Samson report that's relevant as we look to the short term. So uh, the first question that we had, uh, again, we reworded, but what was the, what's the mechanism protocol to determine field use for the many groups who use them based on the overuse of the fields that are currently in poor condition and how can this be improved. And so I described the overuse of the fields and right now the honest truth is we, we have not historically had very clear method of someone who's responsible for managing and making decisions on field use. There are many, many users, they're not all our high school and that's a major problem. It's actually the first recommendation from the Wesson and Sampson study is Amherst should adopt the field use policy to govern the fields this will be essential to allow for improved playing conditions to be achieved and protect any new investments that are made. And so the next steps as we've established them are that the town of Amherst will create a simple central public calendar that can easily be updated and accessed by, by our athletic department and facilities office, EPW and LSSC, for all fields. Um, there are some fields, as we've talked about, that are owned by the region, some are owned in the town. We want to have one system. We don't want to have multiple systems for fields that are adjacent to one another. It just doesn't make any sense. And this is modeling off other towns that have similar public mechanisms so everyone knows which field's being used, uh, by whom, and when, and there's true transparency in the process. The second piece is that um, to develop a protocol by which a Department of Public Works administrator makes a decision about field usage for all fields. And this is, uh, is going to be where the rubber meets the road, uh, I think, for many either teams or community groups. These decisions are based on the recommendations of a staff member with background and expertise in natural turf management. School staff, we help out. We do not have anyone with a degree in natural turf management. And uh, DPW does. We feel like we should be relying on the expert around turf management about field usage. And then uh, the draft that the DPW has developed is on the back page that determines when fields can be used and when they can't. And one of the challenges we've had, and we talked about this the last meeting, is that we've had uh, very wet falls and we've had very dry falls. We had a fall where we 
had water cannons shooting water from War Memorial Pool onto the field to make it playable because there was a water restriction. We couldn't water the fields, and that was a very creative solution to that problem. We've also had the flip side where we've had so much rain that the fields are, are next to unplayable because the drainage doesn't work on that water table in the area. And so um, I appreciate Mr. Mooring for developing a draft policy uh, to help his staff guide decision making on field usage and then looking at alternative fields that may be available. I do want to caution us that the report from Weston and Sampson clearly cites that there, is not a, there are not enough fields currently in the town for the number of people who want to use the fields. So it's not as easy as, well, this other field's going to be available and playable. Uh, that's a complex decision-making tree that we want to, again, rely on the professionals from the Department of Public Works to manage. Because the more, more cooks in that kitchen, uh, the less efficient and effective our management of that will be. So why don't I pause? Because the next one talks about kind of field maintenance, spending, and then I'll ask Mr. Mooring to come up and um, talk about the work that's happened the last month and the work that's planned for the next two months. But I think maybe pausing here because I've talked for a while to see if any committee members have questions would be advisable. I or do. Not. Okay. Uh, so, who finalizes approval of the draft field closure policy? Who's going to be reviewing it? Who actually, I mean, does it go to the town council or something? Or what happens? So, uh, and I don't know, maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. Mr. Zomek or something knows the answer to that question instead, but I'm yeah. just, I'm just, or Mr. Mooring, but I'm just, I'm just curious because yeah. you called it a draft. Yeah. And so that raises the question of how does it move from being a draft to a actual policy? Yeah. I think I'll defer to Mr. Mooring on this one. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we're hoping that the regional school, however they wish to do it through the committee or through the superintendent, and the town manager comes together and decides this is what we're going to do. So that's how we're hoping this become goes from a draft to a final policy. I think leisure services has also been asked to chime in as well. But um, that's so. So is it? I mean, is it is it like an administrative policy that the de that the departments themselves can approve and execute, or is it something that has to be voted by voting bodies? Uh, I, I do not believe we're shooting for voting bodies to vote it. It's um, up. We want to can keep it at the administrative level. Okay, I was just curious. Okay, thank you. And I would just say, if anyone has feedback, anyone in the audience or anyone in the community, because this is all online, uh, please share it with me. I'll definitely bring it to Mr. Mooring's attention and for his staff to review. So we are doing this in a public meeting because authentically, if there is feedback that the community members have, uh, we want to hear it. Um, we did model, and I know Mr. Mooring looked in the Weston and Sampson report. Actually, there's a couple model. Uh, policies from other communities and Mr. Mooring modeled it off. That was sort of the next, that was sort of the underlying point too is that when you can figure out how approvals happen, yeah. then you know how to weigh in to influence things if you want to redraft or something. Mr. Dunley. Yeah, just a <clears throat> minor point of feedback, um, if you're looking for feedback about the, the policy. So just um, when you have the DPW administrator making decisions about field usage for all fields, I just and this is not my area of expertise, but just having heard some of the feedback and some of the complex decision making that has to go on, it, it seems to be hardly ever just a matter of is the field playable or not. Like just a simple analysis. You have to balance, okay, well, if we allow this field to be playable on this day, then it might not be available for XYZ team on this day. And maybe that's only uh, you know the loss of one competition, but maybe that's the most important competition. And so that, that gets into the necessity to have more knowledge about things than maybe just the DPW administrator is required to have. And so, um, you know, some sort of consultation um, with that. It's, it, it almost makes you feel like, uh, think of the, uh, the no-one situation you have with uh, calling a school. <laughs> when you're, you're up at 3 in the morning, you know, listening with, with your superintendents and, and, and weather people and, uh, and getting, getting the, uh, the conditions on the ground and trying to make, you know, a qualitative decision in the best interest of everyone. Like, it's hardly ever a... Clear things. So just that's what my own piece of feedback. Yeah. So I think uh, two thoughts on that. One is later on the document describes how the athletic director position does come frequently in touch with not just Mr. Mooring, but uh, actually more more in touch with Mr. Mooring staff members who are the experts in field conditions to play out that matrix that you described. I think the other hard thing is that we want to you know. Um, I say this, Mr. Farrell said it better than me in a meeting a week or two ago. Um, we don't want to be in the w at the whim of public pressure um, because if the fields need to be rested, the fields need to be rested, and it's a slippery slope to go down. Well, this game is really important, um, 
but who's to say that the team that has a better record is more important than the game two days later from a team that struck, right? And so we want to actually let the fields dictate the decision making instead of prioritizing um, certain games or teams. And, and I think you're right, it's not a black or white or um, there has to be a matrix of decision making, but um, I think we, we've we've paid the, suffered the consequences sometimes of uh, having that public pressure that this tournament has to be played or this game has to be played and the impact on the field go well beyond a day, a week. It really, we've seen it affect fields for the whole season. And so that's, I think, the thinking behind it. Mr. Fonch? Um, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if these are questions are appropriate at this time or when you've completed everything, sure. but no. let me toss them out there just to get them out there. Uh, number one, um, I remain concerned about the specific and explicit relationship between the town and the district on this, um, particularly if the town is going to call a field safe to be used and we go ahead and play the game and a youngster is injured because of the field, who's liable? Secondly, um, things such as this um, have a tendency to evaporate over time. And I'm wondering if the cost of this endeavor is going to be included in a capital plan section of the budget. And would it be included with other capital expenditures so that we can have a sense of, okay, we're spending this money this year. What do we anticipate we're gonna spend next year on the fields? So how do we, how do we prevent budget-wise the fields from falling back into poor condition? And is there some way we can assure the community, which obviously is very concerned about this, is there some way we can ensure the community and the coaches and the players, the kids, that um, we have their back on this? Um, and um, to be honest about it, I need some convincing. Thank you. You can answer whatever you want. Some of those I think you can answer now. Others you might want to. Yeah, actually, the your cost report. one will come up in... But also, I'm just mindful of the fact that we that because of when you paused, um, the public and even the committee itself hasn't heard really what's happened yet and what's mm -hmm. going on. Sure. And that's probably the most salient thing people want to know is, have you been doing work on the fields? What have you been doing? What are you going to do? <laughs> so, oh, that's right. Um, so, if the region is going to be tasked with creating this policy and... Um, approving it, even if it's in partnership with the town. I think it's really important to understand um, how to make these choices and how and be very transparent about how we're doing it. So in the current practice, we say that the priority of use is for PE classes and the high school and middle school athletic programs, which makes sense. But it doesn't really say anything about youth soccer, LSSC, summer camps, um, all of the other organizations and interests that have um, a use of these fields. And I'm wondering, and um, you know, I haven't combed through the report as thoroughly as I have, but if we're gonna be, it sounds like DPW is gonna be making a call about whether or not the fields are safe. But if there aren't enough fields for the current demand, who's going to be making that call about who gets to use this limited resource? And I think we need to be very transparent about it and, and have an understanding uh, very basically of what the current use is and what would a potential higher, and we're gonna to have to create some sort of hierarchy that goes beyond just the PE and the middle school and high school. So if this is gonna be covered in, in this conversation now, I'm, I'm happy to hold off and, and listen, but if it's not, I think we really need more information on what's currently happening and reach out to those interests because it's, this is where it's really gonna get messy and people are gonna be disappointed. So uh, I'm gonna, I think that's a really honest question. I can give you uh, as honest answer as I can give. So I think a couple things. One is, I think you're right, and that's why one of the advantages of DPW taking on this role is not just their expertise, but that actually going through one public calendar that's managed by one organization as compared to now, which is a hodgepodge of uh, a myriad of things, uh, it doesn't work. Our current model doesn't work, right? So our athletic department, our facilities department, we work very closely with LSE, their partners are in the middle school building, and with Amateur Youth Soccer, all these other organizations. The region can't manage 
all those organizations, and it, it's it, it's putting you know frankly an undue burden on the region uh, to be able to do that. We do it in concert with with TPW, but it's actually trying to streamline the process around it. I think. In terms of current use, the Wesson and Samson report does a pretty good thorough study, and I know you know we got that on Friday, and it's, it's a long report, but it actually did uh, a snapshot of exactly who's using the fields, um, which different community organizations are use, using them. I think you're right to highlight if these experts are saying we have essentially we're overusing the fields and we don't have enough fields for the current demand, that's a townwide problem. Um, and it, this gets really complicated because we're a regional school district that's responsible for four towns and we're part of this whole constellation of town fields. Um, I think maybe towards the end of the conversation we could take about advocacy and what not just at the regional school committee but actually across the town people feel urgency about this topic and so I want to be cautious that this is bleeding naturally and this is not your question. It bleeds into larger issues. So if you look at the Weston and Samson, for instance, it talks about Plum Brook which is not fields that are owned by the region, they're owned by the town of Amherst, uh, and yet they have huge implications for Amherst Youth Soccer, which is an example you, you use in other soccer organizations. And so the need, I think the report does a good job of laying out kind of the urgency of do we have enough fields, are they playable, are they in good condition, were they designed for their current usage? Uh, the answer to all those questions is no. Um, I want to be really honest about it, so we're going to do the best we can to manage with the fields and especially in this role, in terms of our student athletes at our middle school and high school level, um, there are some things we can't control, and I think it will take lots of advocacy across multiple towns, um, as well as the town of Amherst, to be able to work on this. And, and sorry to, I was going to say this later, but perhaps worth saying now that um, I have not heard broad support from all four towns. Not that we've asked the question, but I've gotten actually information from at least one select board and finance committee of one of the member towns suggesting they do not want to participate in any work on the fields. Um, so I think the political complications of this are really deep. So I'm sorry to be that blunt in response, um, but I, I think I also want to contextualize that um, the crossover between town of Amherst regional um, concerns are complex and we're trying to actually, as best we can, streamline how we're approaching it, how the fields are used, how they're maintained, and what the choices are and make it transparent. We have a lot more to go through, but I just want to give any other members of the committee a chance if they have a question, they have a comment they want to make at the moment. I mean, one of the things I think, um, Superintendent, that um, as you're going through the remainder of the presentation to be helpful is to try to um, divide out those things that we're dealing with immediately, right. particularly around safety, which I think the closure policy discusses, things that I'm not sure you're going to have an answer for now, or even should. Like, how do we actually manage scheduling and utilization of the fields more globally, regardless of closure? Because um, I'm, I'm going to editorialize and throw. I think if you had an answer right now, you'd make a lot of people really angry right. if you simply announced it and said, "Here's the solution," without lots of stakeholder yes. engagement, including by other folks outside of the school district itself. Um, and then there's obviously the third bucket is what. How do we move forward in the long term, including some of the capital expenditure issues that Mr. Fonshit raised? But I mean, I'm just saying this because yep. I think the conversation could get really muddy if we start talking about all these different things simultaneously, and I won't help people get clarity about what what are we actually doing right now, sure. and how do they get involved going forward to continue to make progress. Yeah. So I'll go to question two. But resources come from the district for field maintenance. Does it need to be increased? So what do we need to spend additional funds are? So you can see a table that Mr. Farrell put together of spending in FY18, spending in FY19. Um, this was level funded in the budget that was passed um, by all four towns as well as the school committee this spring. And in consultation with Mr. Mooring, Mr. Farrow, we've increased um, well over 200%. That line from uh, the spending last year was about 15000 to 34000 for the next school year. Um, that means we're going to enter next year unless something different happens at the state level in a deficit, and so be it. Budget's an estimate, and the needs are urgent, so we're just going to do it. Um, and um, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Mooring talk about uh, both what's happened in the last month, which is in the current fiscal year, but also how those funds would be used to improve the field conditions uh, for the next year, both in the fall and the spring. So I think Mr. Mooring will take it from here. I have some pictures for you to start off. So there's a before picture and an after picture. So the before picture is after the Frisbee, <laughs> the old, excuse me, 
Ultimate, sorry. Oh my god. Um, and then the after picture is today. They took the picture today. So just so you see, there is some change going on, and it's actually, you can tell, we're doing some good things. Um, they aerated the field, we've been aerating it. Let's make sure you hit the microphone there. So make, it's not that since close. your back's to the audience, also I want to make sure they can hear you. So we did some air, we did aerating. We did two types of aerating, but we don't have what we call a deep tongue aerating. We did small little plug aerating. It takes out little plugs in the ground like you would do in your lawn at home. And we also just did some uh, vibratory aerating, which goes down, shakes the soil a little bit, and comes up. Uh, we've been overseeding. We fertilized. We did some rolling, and when we've been doing, uh, we, we've been mowing again, just making sure we keep it at the right elevations. So all that's been done in the last weeks since it's stopped raining and we can get on the fields and mow. Um, if you notice from the past, our mowers are much smaller now. Um, we used to have a 20-foot mower. We're down to a 12-foot mower because we can't put the big mowers on the fields anymore. That's how bad the fields are. They get wet and they stay wet and they won't support big equipment anymore. We have to use smaller equipment and we've actually shifted down a little bit. which use a smaller mower, it takes longer to mow. So, but this is what we've been doing so far. Um, and we want to take the extra money that we're gonna put forward and we're gonna do some deep tongue aerating, which are a 12 inch spike goes into the ground, several of them, shakes the ground up, and then you top dress it with sand to fill in those voids and make sort of a drainage layer and a, a layer that's not compacted, give more air, oxygen into the soil and so forth. Um, that's the one thing we want to try to do the most of with this money we're, we're getting. Um, and then we'll continue to overseed and fertilize them. Slice, we want to come in, slice seed it before the fall, get some seeds in, get something going before the spring. Um, both the people who work in our division who head this division, Alan Snow and Adam Feltman, are graduates of Stockbridge. They came from UMass. They've been through that program over there. One's a, one is a turf guy. Adam's the turf guy. Um, Alan's the overall overall person. He's more trees and um, horticulture than he is turf. Um, so we do have two people on staff. They talk extensively to UMass when they need to. They do all sorts of re research and outreach to them to ask questions. So we're using all the all the little tools in our toolbox we have in the area, and we're trying to use all our tools to, to make things better. Um, the unfortunate part is, is that budget hasn't increased much. Um, the one, there's been two increases, and those increases were to take on the pools, mostly, and take on garbage pickup. Um, the town <coughs> manages the pools, including the middle school pool. Um, the town picks up trash, including trash at the regional fields where events go on. It's not the custodians who come out and do it, it's the five guys in the park and rec division. So the five guys in the park and rec division maintain these fields, they maintain the commons, they maintain the town athletic fields, they do trash pickup, they maintain pools, and a couple other things. There's two other guys who do trees, but there's five employees, which isn't included in your account of expenses. There's five other employees who manage, who do all that work. All the equipment that's used comes from the town budget, not from the region budget. Every once in a while, the regional help pay for a, a specific thing we needed. Uh, we, we needed some new tines for our aerator at one point. The region paid for that. The region does pay for seeding and fertilizer like you see. They pay for turfus for drying the fields and so forth. Um, but all the other stuff comes from the town general fund budget. Uh, I think I answered, that's covered everything with that, I hope. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Mr. Um, on page two of the summary, it says that the DPW will prioritize the most effective use of these funds to improve the field conditions. Um, since the final decision is in your hands, what assurances do uh, will we have as a committee and the community have that gender equity will be considered in the decision? The way we're approaching is that we're going to do all the fields the same. We're not going to just do this one field this way and do this field this way. When we take our approach, all the regional fields will be done the same way, and including community field, which is the town field. That's how we're going to approach it. But it does says prioritize. Uh, you've kind of been prioritized. Those are the fields that get it first, and then other fields outside the t of the region and the community field will get, the, okay. get it looked at next. Okay. Thank you. 
Other questions? Yes, I have one. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, that the, the town of Amherst supplies your basic operating budget and that there's some money in supplemental from the regional school district for the kinds of things that are mentioned on the table. Um, do you, this is going to sound like a stupid question because every answer is we could always use more money and more staff. But I guess I'm just wondering um, if you if do you do you need more staff in this area, and if so, what would they be doing that would add value? Be, I mean, beyond in other words, whole new fields, whole reconstruction. I'm saying in terms of in terms of ordinary maintenance, uh, what's the is there a next order of business that needs to be done? You've already hit my first one, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> the second one is, is seasonal employees. It used to be all the high school students and the graduating seniors and some of the students who graduated and went to college and came back for the summer, they'd want jobs in the summer, and they'd come to the town and look for jobs. Do you know how many people do that now? Zero. Zero. N none of the students are encouraged to come back, help work for the town, come back and do something. Um, that's what we really, really need in the summer, is to have the ability to tap into students and to young people who are coming back for just a small summer job. We pay $15 an hour, you know, we, but we actually pay less than McDonald's and well, Burger King's gone. We pay not less than McDonald's, but there's no pool of young people to draw from to help supplement. And, you know, we don't need them to like go out and be experts. We need them to do little things like let them pick the trash up versus having the guys we have trained pick up the trash. The guys who we employ who are, who are specialists in what they do, let them do their specialties and not be burdened with this trash thing or burdened with other things that are insignificant. But there is no, <clears throat> there is no program to channel those people in. And when you talk to the counselors at the schools, they're trying to send us people who really shouldn't be operating any equipment at all. Um, I hate to say that. Um, but yeah, the, we, we kind of miss out on this pool of people anymore, and there's nobody around to bring in for the summer. I was only able to hire three seasonal employees for the whole department, and we used to hire close to 12 or 15 every year. And they were spread out in the water, in the highway, in the parks and recs, and in the engineering division. I actually put them in with my engineering technicians and send them out in construction jobs. So we have one person in, working in parks this year, we have one person in, um, working for um, uh, engineering, and we have one highway guy. That's it. But we can't get that. That, that would be the one thing. Sorry. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I mean, that, that sounds like something that could receive some attention, and we could try to have an organized effort to help fill that gap. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to share that that we can do some outreach as well. Right. I'm, so sorry, so really I'm looking at you only to say proceed. Yeah, so I think the <laughs> other, th other thing to note here, and, and, and I don't want to get too off topic, but I think the people talked about the finances. And um, so one of our challenges is that our athletic department over time, uh, we've struggled to maintain um, the needs uh, from a funding perspective that uh, increasingly that we're uh, finding ways to cover the rest of the program. That's not to say it's not valued. We do it because we value the athletics. We value this high school in particular has a wider array of sports than any other high school, I think, in Hampshire or Franklin County, uh, which are the two counties that our member towns are, are in. Uh, but it is a financial challenge um, that we've had, and I don't need to tell all of you about the financial challenges of getting budgets passed the last few years. And, and the uncomfortable conversation, perhaps, on page 53 of the, the full strategic plan um, is 53 and 54. They come up with an, a number of ways to fund operational maintenance. Uh, but there are things that, in, in general, our district has tried to shy away from, including you know, increasing user fees, concession fees, parking fees, uh, basically tournament fees. They're fee-centric uh, types of things. Um, so I think when we talk about increasing funding long term, to Mr. Fonch's point earlier, I think there's one which is the operational budget, which is what funds the support we're able to offer for the DPW's work. Um, the capital piece, I think, is a, a separate conversation about the long term implications. Capital we don't think of as ongoing yearly expenses. That's a more short, you know, one time expense. 
to improve the condition, um, but it is something that we're going to have to talk about next year um, as a committee and as a community is if we want to maintain the number of sports teams we have, improve the field conditions, at some point we're going to have to pay for it in a, in a, con in a situation that um, we have a lot of fiscal constraints at the moment um, between our four member towns. And so I don't want to belabor that point, but I, do, I did feel like I'd be remiss not mentioning that the, the funding is an issue. It will continue to be an issue. These issues won't be resolved. I think the plan we have is to improve the playing conditions. They're not permanent fixes that Mr. Mooring and his staff are working on for the fields. They're, they are fixes to improve the quality, to make sure that the fields are safe and playable for our student athletes. None of this funding and this work is going to resolve some of the issues cited both in this report as well as the Weston and Sampson report about the condition of the fields. Uh, just real quick on the, so you talked about the cost of the athletic program increasing and running a deficit, approximately 40000 this year. The first thing noted is uncollected participation fees. How, how big of, of the $40,000 chunk is that? And, and, and what are the factors related to not being able to collect that? I mean, we're never going to be able to collect 100.0%, but, but how bad is it getting and, and what, how much attention do we get? So I don't have those numbers at the top of my head, but what I can have is Mr. Mangano does have them, and I can email them to the committee. Um, but it's a significant chunk of that 40000 um, We try not to take punitive measures when student athletes, we don't, we don't allow cost to be a factor in participation. Um, so if student, whether they receive subsidized lunch or not, we try to make payment plans, we try to work with families, but we've not been successful in collecting all the dues that uh, have been assigned regardless of lunch status. Um, that's another one we can certainly come back to in the fall. But um, Mr. Mangano can get the specific numbers and the historical numbers as well so you can see the trends over time. Thank you. I think it'd be also, by the way, useful since we, we have a new approach now to reaching out to parents and guardians around um, uncollected school lunch. Right. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if we use the same approach for athletic participation phase or not. We'll be transitioning to that approach. Okay. Yep. Uh, good. Okay, so uh, I don't think I'm gonna belabor the number three. I think we've already talked a bit about how the town and school department coordinate field maintenance. Uh, that'll continue. Uh, I think the only thing that's probably not on here as explicitly as I'd like is that our facility staff and the district level does support the fields in some ways. They do, they do some cleanup. Uh, some of the hills that we have on our fields, some of our equipment is a little more attuned to do that as opposed to the big fields, which the DPW's equipment is more attuned to. So there is coordination and communication between the DPW and our facilities group as well, but the, the lion's share of the work um, is done by DPW staff. So uh, why are the field conditions so poor? Are there equity concerns about better field conditions? So this uh, report by Mr. Farrow, which he pulled some from the Wesson and Sampson, tries to describe each of the fields that we have, uh, what the challenges are, and you could see it varies by field. Some of the Fields struggle with turf coverage. Some of them um, struggle with drainage. Um, and at different times of the year, different fields are more playable than others. And that, that really significantly contributes to some of the challenges that we have, um, that there doesn't seem to be a time of year where all the fields are in wonderful shape. Um, some are much better in the fall, and some after the winter uh, end up much more playable. So perhaps the most relevant piece is on the last page of that handout, where. Mr. Farrow describes his plan for 2019 space, field space allocation and the goal that Mr. Farrow is working on and, and we're working on collectively is how do we reduce the load on any given field to improve the condition, avoid the overuse challenges, and make sure every team as best we can has a home field. I want to note that the coaches have been consulted, particularly um, coach as it relates to field hockey has been consulted because uh, that one is a significant shift in location. Um, so this. Uh, should not come as a surprise to some of the people, the coaches in the room, but um, the community field utilized by the football program, practices and games, uh, and it describes some of the painting, um, and it's the same as we've had the last couple seasons. JV soccer and girls lacrosse, um, utilized by the JV teams for practices and games, and that's consistent. So one of the changes that Mr. Farrow and the coaches have been working on is the middle school multi-use field to transition field hockey for practice and games to that field. Um, there's upsides and there's downsides. The upside um, is that it's a, a much smoother overall surface and a flatter surface, which as we know is for field hockey in particular is critically important. Uh, there's room to paint additional arc as is written. Work has already started to repair the patchy areas and create a playable surface. It would not be shared with other um, varsity teams. 
Uh, it actually happens to be one of the better viewing sites because of the natural hill. Like if you think of Wildwood coming down, um, it's, it's actually, a, a, I've watched a girls lacrosse game there this spring. It's a really nice location to watch a game. It is a little removed from the high school and that is the downside. Uh, and we actually chatted about that before the meeting. And for us, as a short-term fix, uh, we feel like that's the best, uh, the best potential site for field hockey, uh, given, uh, again, the lack of slope and um, the lack of other use on that field, that it'll be preserved and that the student-athletes who will be participating will have the best surface possible and the safest surface possible as compared to other surfaces. Uh, trying to uh, rest, you know, what was the field hockey field, an ultimate Frisbee field, uh, and it can be a backup field, but what we know is that um, that field has been tremendously overused and is uh, really showing the signs of that overuse. And um, when we think about fall sports, the feeling of you know, both Mr. Farrow and the coach is that, that we, don't wanna, we don't have confidence that that field will be in as playable condition as the multi-use field uh, behind the middle school particular to the needs of field hockey. You know, other sports would be less important to have that smooth surface, but given the nature of the sport, um, that was a decision that was made. Track field would be used by the varsity boys and girls soccer teams. Um, and um, if, if it needs rest during the fall, looking at the former field hockey field uh, as a backup. And the boys lacrosse football practice field be rested as much as possible um, so that it has really, um, it really needs to recover. That's another one that's been just brutalized by the overuse. And uh, we want to try to see if we can rest it in the fall and get it back to better playing condition in the spring. And, you know, the last thing on this report was how do families volunteer their time to improve the field under the supervision direction. And, you know, you heard Mr. Mooring say that he, uh, in my opinion, is not opposed to help, not opposed to support. And, you know, he listed some of the things um, that families or students or anyone in the community can do that would truly make an impact and allow his staff to be more focused on some of the more technical side of things. And they can reach out to him directly, and some already have, um, to support that. Uh, we'll do some work on the terms of summer work and the positions that are unfilled right now uh, at the DPW that are paid positions, but I think um, the way our fields are, and, I, and what I've heard from Mr. Mooring, is the more help, the better, that there's no opposition, actually, to be open arms to support the DPW and its tasks. And that's it for that report. I think in terms of the rest of the Wesson and Sampson, so there's a lot of reports out. I think we need to come back to that early in the fall um, around some of the long-range planning, but I think we've had, we have enough to focus on tonight for getting ready for the next academic year. Um, that I know Mr. Mike, we talked a little earlier and we felt like he's certainly willing to come back and walk the committee and the community through uh, some of the longer term work that Wesson and Sampson proposed. Just a summary comment. Do you believe the playing fields will be safe for the fall? So the indication I've received and Mr. Mooring can jump in is that the, there's um, feelings that they will be in better condition than they've been in the past few years. I think the only reason I can't say confidently is we don't know if it's going to rain for the next month and a half, or if it's not going to rain the next month and a half. So I think the weather is a variable, but I do think the time, attention, and care and planning that's going into this fall and spring season is at a much higher level than it's been the last few years. I don't know if Mr. Mooring has anything you'd like to add. No, that's pretty much it. So um, I began by asking the question Oof, of. I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. Too many documents. You know what I'm going to ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have spot on. How can the what what's going to happen next? What's sure. going to happen over the summer? Yeah. I, obviously, this is going to be on the agenda in the fall, yeah. right? No. Um, for first thing, first thing. But also, um, how do how do people a get involved? B, how do they? I mean, I don't mean this in a funny way, but I just mean it given the salience. How do they check up on your work right. uh, over the summer? What's next? Sure. So, Mr. Mooring, you know, describe some of the work that will be occurring over the summer. These are public fields. Anyone, you know, is certainly willing to. Look, but we talked about having a meeting in late July. Um, the athletic calendar starts a little before the school year calendar. So, you know, looking at the regional school committee calendar for next year, we don't want to wait that long to get back in the room because that actually is too late, not only from planning purposes, but literally next time we're in that room together that we practice. Yeah, I'm happening. not talking about us. I'm talking about... Oh, yeah, about... yeah. But I'm just saying this is a public meeting. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, so we talked about a late July date where we could have a public meeting and Mr. Mooring and his staff could update the community about where we are where the work is, what the weather conditions have been, and how they've adjusted their plan based on the conditions they've seen. Um, so I, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Moore. So we've talked a little bit about kind of doing what some other communities are doing, is actually having a 
on the, on the website the ability to go to each each field and each recreation area and see what's going on. And we can you know post yes this is what the field this is uh, what you could use here and then we can actually post what is being done. Um, we've talked about setting something like that up so people can just go and see. Um, we've also talked about using that as our mechanism for announcing when we field, close a field. If we're closing a field, it would pop up closed, and then people could also, if we use that methodology, we could they could sign up on the web page to get notifications of field use, and they would actually get that texted to them or emailed to them as well. So we're kind of looking at how to, how to give more people input and insight into what we're doing. Um, we're leaning toward more towards the web page and those type of things as being ways to get things out there. Um, and if you ask, we'll, we'll tell you as well. So that's what we're trying to hope to do. Okay. Spitzer. Um, comment directly related to that. I think it's important to have, um, and then two other comments, and, and important to have a, a two-way street. So I think um, making it, I guess one of my questions would be, it seems like it, there should be a really clear way for folks to let you know, I've seen this problem at the field and it seems like the DPW is the one to notify rather than the district. And just, but correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and we should make it really clear on the website how they can provide you with that feedback. Um, the other two, two things I wanted to raise is kind of like this question of how can families volunteer their time to improve the fields. Um, it seems like another piece, and I'm, we talked about this earlier, but it should be advocate, <laughs> you know, not only to us, but to the town. And to, to your, you know, probably people in this room are outside of, you know, not just Amherst, but all of all of the towns that the district represents. And potentially, I, I, I think we should talk about this at a future date, but the potential for fundraising, um, public-private partnerships around these fields. Because, I mean, the big issue seems to be money, and I don't think there's going to be more coming in um, in the near future unless something... I don't know, maybe marijuana tax can be used for this. I don't know. But I'm just thinking, like, we, we, there seemed to be an interest in that in the last meeting we were at, at the potential for, and either we need, it seems like we should have a clear response on whether or not that's something the district would be open to. And it seems like we, if we do do that kind of thing, we'd need to think about this equity question, and I'd advocate for, you know, maybe not having it go to a specific sport or a specific field, but have a general way of making sure that all those funds lift all of the programs instead of just, you know, the, the ones that get the most uh, attention. Do you have any direct response before we go to Mr. Demlin? I don't see one. Mr. Demlin. No, no, it's okay. Mr. Demlin. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to wholeheartedly agree with Ms. Spitzer's comment, and it's more of like a, uh, you know, to the public comment. So you heard um, the superintendent uh, allude to, you know, the political challenges with getting this funded. So at, at like a, a big high level, if, if the school committee is totally on board, and so I'm, I'm talking about the long-term solution here. It, for say, like a three, four, or five million dollar expenditure for a stadium, build a stadium. That's all great that we approve it. Then all four towns need to approve it. So that's how the process works, right? School committee approves it, but then it has to get approved by the Amherst Town Council, Pelham Town Meeting, Leverett Town Meeting, Shutesbury Town Meeting. The town meetings are informed by their finance board, the select boards. So this requires not just one meeting or one email of advocacy, this requires multiple meetings, multiple emails of advocacy. And in terms of when you start that, I would start that right now. I would, if, if you're so motivated, go home, depending on what town you live in, and send an email and say, this is important to me. Because I, I, I'll tell you, there are other really important capital needs uh, in Amherst and, and Pelham and Shutesbury that aren't getting funded. And you know, you're gonna be at a capital meeting and there will be some irrational people there, but there'll be some other rational people there too. And they'll talk about things that, you know, they need, they need another fire truck or whatever it is. So this is something that is gonna to have to be a sustained thing. And um, it's, I've been really encouraged by the tone of the public comments. It's very collaborative and, you know, okay, this is a problem. You're telling me you see the urgency, how do we work together? And that's great because we're all gonna to have to work on this together as we advocate to our towns to get to a final solution. Further, so I do. I do think that um, Ms. Spitzer's comment that, I, and I assume you're open to this, that there ought to be a clear way of reporting to you concerns about individual fields. Like if somebody goes to a field and they're practicing soccer with their kid, and they say, "Holy moly, <laughs> I can see this problem." There's got to be some easy way to 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 be able to report that. Uh, so hopefully that'll be done. 
Um, we, we have, there's so much we're going to need to follow up on. Yeah. Um, if there, I think that what I'd hope you do is, you know, inform the committee, uh, but also let us know when the, you know, there's, a, I'd like some sort of midsummer report to the committee, even if we don't meet, just share the report with us on updating us where we're at. Mm -hmm. And then also let us know when this public meeting is going to be in July. Um, so that we can attend. If, if it's too much of us, then we can't talk. <laughs> we'll have to just sit and listen. But as we often know, that's not always a bad thing. That's kind of a good thing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the other update for both the committee and the community was uh, as we hire a new athletic director, making sure that you're informed of that because that person will play a pretty critical role in working with DPW, the community, the committee, and myself on this. So right. um, I just want to, that, that is something that we uh, have a high degree of urgency about. and. Uh, we'll be working on the next couple of weeks. Right. So this is only the beginning, as we say. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of points of engagement. Okay. Anything else from the committee? Mr. Sponge. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to ask if, um, in terms of um, hiring a new athletic director, I, I would just like to see particularly strong effort to look at qualifications of a woman and a person of color going forward respond to that. So, sure. Um, the short answer is we are consistently looking for underrepresented groups, particularly in the administrative ranks, but certainly in the teaching ranks, and um, my answer to that wouldn't be any different for the athletic director than any other position. That, um, so the answer is yes, and um, it doesn't have to be a special treatment. This is the way we approach our work. We should follow up also on this question of how to help the DPW hire people, hire young people in the summertime. Yeah. There's got to be some way of doing that. Yep. And if they have the funds to hire 12 people instead of three, yeah. then let's help them hire Absolutely. 12 people instead of three. Yep. Um, okay. Would it be okay for me to ask a procedural question? Proce procedural question, sure. Yeah. Um, so Can you go to the microphone? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So just in terms of, of um, moving forward, yes. who, who would be the best person to direct our questions, concerns, ideas to so that, so that it's not, you know, in the – in the stratosphere somewhere, but it's actually directed to a person who will be able to disseminate, get the answers. Is it this committee? Is it directly the superintendent? I would, I would assume w? it would be to the superintendent and the D head of the DPW, and I might send it to both of them depending on the nature of the question. If it's a question, I mean, you can, yeah. by the way, really answer it, but I'm saying if, it, if it's essentially like a, 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 a school team's related question, then obviously the superintendent's going to want to be engaged on it. The more it's leaning towards how are the fields doing and what are you doing? Maybe even neither of those things. Maybe more about about conceptually, like you know, brainstorming. Like, it, who who's the body that is moving this whole thing forward? And if it's you guys, it's you guys. I'm not. I'm. Just, I'm, I'm asking sincerely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not you know. It's no point. And I think I think that's an awesome question. And I think that the I think I think and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Both of your thoughts on this. Um, I think like a lot of things we have, and I guess say in this town, because this is more of an Amherst thing than it is necessarily just a region thing, um, there has been a sort of divided or, or scattered authority around how we manage some of these things. And you can see where the cracks start coming up in something like this. This isn't the only area that's true of. I'm not going to bother naming them, but there, there are other areas that might come to mind where you think to yourself, who's really in charge of that building? And there's not a great answer to the question about who's really responsible. Uh, and so, you know, I think that I think right now the answer is going to be I would send the emails to the superintendent and to Mr. Mooring um, because that's the only way you can know that the two. I always look to say, well, who's actually in charge of something? And ultimately, if it's in the school districts, the superintendent's in charge uh, underneath the, guide, the the supervision of the school committee. But day to day, that's the person who's in charge. And then ultimately, outside of the time manager, the assistant time manager who's hiding right behind you, um, uh, Mr. Mooring is really accountable for this. And so and I think one of the things that's going to have to happen, I think is going to have to happen, but others may disagree, is I think as we go ahead through, we need to make this field safe and playable in the fall. Um, what we also need to do is try to figure out how are we going to manage it. I guess the question Ms. Spitzer had earlier is you can't, you can't, I mean, forgive me for saying this, uh, you're not really just going to make the DPW chief in charge suddenly of, of organizing, scheduling, and accessing all of the athletic fields in town. Like you might be able to close them if they're unplayable, but in terms of literally saying you're gonna have to be like the czar of all sports leagues in town, 
that's probably not even desired by, by Mr. Mooring, but it's also completely impractical, right? So you know it can't work that way, right? And so the question is, how is it going to work? And the answer, I think to be honest, I'm going to be, because you may not want to say this, I think the answer is we don't know, which means we need to keep engaged on this. And so the first order of business is how do you maintain the fields, how do you keep track on that, and how do you start setting up a policy around necessary closures so that we can get organized for this fall? Is that right? Or am I off base? No, I would agree with that. So I'd write both, right now I'd write both. Mr. Morin, please. Yes, you can write me as well, but this has been, been raised to a very high level, the town level as well. So sending it to the town manager, to the town manager's office, will get you into the top of this world where he wants to be involved. I mean, Mr. Zomack has spent a lot of time doing this, Weston and Sampson report. So if you get it in there, it actually gets stays a little, I mean, I'll take it and do it, but... Even what you may ask me is something that I have to go farther up. And right now, I think, you know, the superintendent and the town manager are the top of the two pyramids. You might want to just shoot there first, and then they'll filter it down to where it needs to go. And this goes, actually, I think Mr. Dunning and Ms. Spitzer were saying earlier that if you, if you, I'm not going to speak to the other towns. In the other towns, write your select board, you know, write your town manager. Um, but in the Amherst, uh, the, I, I, my observation has been that the, the councilors, have been pretty engaged in wanting to learn about what's going on in town and what's affecting people who live here. And um, because this, again, is an area with bifurcated authority and lines of budgetary authority and other things, this is a classic example of something in which you're going to be doing those counselors a favor. Even if you don't know what the answer is, but you know what the concern is, you'd be doing them a huge favor um, by writing them as well and saying, hey, look, if you're not been following us in the paper, um, this is what's going on. This is what I'm experiencing with my kid. You'd be doing, I mean, I mean that very seriously. You'd be doing them a huge favor because the worst thing that could happen to them is they show up in a meeting in August and people are screaming at them saying, you know, why didn't this happen better? And so they're, what they're going to say is, well, why didn't you write me in June when I could have leaned in more? So in addition to the town manager, I'd say call, write, your, write your town councilor, write your select board if you're one of the other towns. Anything else? Thank you. There's a lot of work to be done. So the point is, this is the end of tonight's discussion, but it's hardly the end of this work. Thank you. You're welcome. Seal of biliteracy possible vote. Seven, item 7B. Uh, would you like to introduce? Yeah, so at the last regional meeting, Ms. Richardson described the seal of biliteracy. Um, some districts, the early adopter districts, like I know Worcester's one and, and uh, some more urban centers actually th had this in place um, just last couple weeks with their graduation. This would allow us to uh, start implementing the seal by literacy next year. We'd be looking at uh, multiple grade levels, 6, 8, and 12, but the particular one that involves a school committee is the 12th grade one because it actually ends up something that is on transcripts and is part of the graduation exercises that students have in, uh, basically, if they meet certain qualifications, they receive this seal of biliteracy as they graduate. We think it's a wonderful thing to celebrate our multilingual students, and we would like the endorsement of the school committee. Okay, are there other questions? Can I ask a question? <coughs> Dumb question. I know we've talked about this before, but sometimes I don't always know who we is. Did we talk about this in the regional meeting, or did we talk about this at the Amherst <laughs> committee meeting, we've or only, both? We've only talked about this at the regional committee. Uh, at the Amherst committee, we certainly could bring it to the school committee, but, but there's, it's not a formal graduation no, 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 piece. That's, so that's it okay. I, I just, I, because that, there, I know this is going to sound dumb, yeah. but since we, since we have in fact talked about it in this venue, <laughs> then we don't have to keep talking about it as much right. as if we talked about it in a different venue. <laughs> yeah. Then we'd want a whole presentation and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so if there's any, any questions from the committee or even I'll entertain a motion, um, depending on what you want to do. Mr. Dunley. Uh, I move to endorse the Amherst Regional School District's formal implementation of the seal of biliteracy beginning in the 2019-2020 school year. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion of the item? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand aye. It carries unanimously, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us. Seven to nothing. Thank you very much. Um, policy review, first reading. Somebody say something? Okay, there's an echo. Uh, first reading of JIC Student Code of Conduct, Student Conduct and Discipline. And this is our first reading, which means this is one of those greatly ambitious things because we can, we'll do our first reading now and then we'll do our second reading quite a long time from now. <laughs> 
So this is a test. Remember. <laughs> Would you like to introduce it? Sure. Um, so yeah, it's a test of how good our memory will be over the summer, right? Um, so I, I think we had hoped to have a different policy ready by now, um, but we'll tackle that um, uh, in when we reconvene in August, and that was the um, the policies, the organizational policies that we needed to address given the new government in Amherst. Um, but this is one that actually we had started working on and we were waiting for feedback from um, council on this, which is um, actually it's, it's three policies. Um, so we, we don't have all three policies in this packet, but um, with, uh, when we come back for the second read, let's make sure that we have the other two. But there's, we have three current policies, which um, JIC, JKD and JKE that all deal with student discipline and student conduct. Um, and we, in, in going through the policies, noticed that it hadn't been updated since 2006 or even looked at. And then when we spoke with council, learned that actually the underlying regulations and laws had changed substantially and guidance from DESE had been um, different. So there was actually a need for us to do um, re-look at these. So that's why we sort of took these up. Um, and in doing so, so the first policy that's in there, it says current policy, that's one of the current ones. Um, the, the proposed policy would still be JIC, that would replace JIC, and we'd eliminate JKD and JKE. The advice from our council was our, a lot of our current policy um, on student discipline actually just repeats almost verbatim um, statute and regulations. And the advice from council was don't do that because then we constantly have to update every time any guidance from DESE changes or regulations, laws are changed. And then all of a sudden our policy is out of date and actually inaccurate. Um, so instead, the language in the proposed policy that we're reading tonight um, covers and refers to the statute, the underlying statutes about discipline, um, suspension, and expulsion. Um, and really focuses um, the first few paragraphs on what are the beliefs and values of, of this school committee in, in um, addressing student conduct in, in our schools. Um, and so that's how we've approached this. And this is modeled off of the MASC um, model uh, statute, uh, sorry, policy but with um, specific chain, um, adjustments based on what we believe is, is our, our values and, and beliefs, particularly around restorative practices, restorative justice, and restorative circles. Um, so it, I'm going to look to Carrie if, you, if, if, I, if you want to add anything on this, um, if I missed anything in, in sort of introducing this. No, I think um, you did a really good job um, summarizing, and I want to thank you for all your hard work on this, um, and this was Moreland as well. Um, and just say that I think the the big piece that would really be helpful if people have any strong feedback, and I think is the statement of our values in and, and, and the beginning. And um, we, as a subcommittee, tried to really you know, shape it and um, would welcome feedback. So. Okay, um, so this is the first reading. So I guess what we'll do is we'll take questions for the policy subcommittee or any comments and then not belabor it, frankly, because we're going to have another bite at the apple. Um, so are there any, Mr. Menino? Is this also going to appear on the Pelham School Committee um, agenda because it says Pelham Elementary School? No idea. I can make a process statement, sorry, sure. um, which is generally policy. Um, are considered at the region, and then um, the municipal elementary districts consider whether to bring them to the elementary level. So that's been the past practice. Actually, maybe even in. Oh, I think there's a policy, policy about the policy. About that. Yeah, <laughs> so me. we'll continue to have no idea. You should take it up with your chair. <laughs> I don't mean that in a funny way. I just. Oh, I know. It just says the, the, the heading. Well, the new policy does. Yes. No, I understand what you're saying. Are there? I, I think it's a letterhead issue almost. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, no, I mean, I think the serious answer was that you'll, you should take it up with your chair and the superintendent and figure, figure it out. Uh, are there other, are there other uh, questions or comments at the moment? I agree with what you're saying that, that getting the, the sort of the tone of the values 
statement essentially or purpose statement at the beginning is critical and I also respect the fact that obviously one of the things we've, we've been trying to do is find alternatives to traditional punitive forms of discipline in general and so reflecting that in here um, is, is critical and I think you're, you've, been do, you've been you're trying to do that. Mr. Um I guess one question that would be helpful to know uh, when, we, when we next bite this apple uh, is so this, the section on the principal may um, remove a student from privileges such as extracurricular activities and attendance at school sponsored events based on the student's misconduct. That, that seems like a fairly broad authority. Um, I'm not questioning it, but I, I, I am curious as to whether that's common uh, mm -hmm. across the state um, and, uh, and, and what, what our current administration team um, think, thinks of that in, in this context. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be answered now, but, you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, it doesn't happen very often here. I can't speak for other districts. Um, and primarily, uh, when it does occur, it's around student safety. Does that answer? Uh, yeah, to, to, a, to a degree. You okay. know, I, I would be more interested uh, at our, again, at our next Apple Bite. Sure. Um, is, is this the, the way it is, like, it, typically? Is this, is this an exception? And, and what does our current administrative team, both, both in central office and at the, at the high school and middle school, um, you know, think about that? Just, just because it's, it's one of those loopholes that right. says, okay, at the principal's discretion, you know, basically ignore everything else. So, so maybe I can... Yeah, please. Right. So, so I think the... So I'm not on the policy subcommittee, but but I think the reason that the language is in there, first of all, it's I think consistent with MGL. Um, but I think the reason it's different from the other is it's talking about disciplinary consequences that don't involve what more typically is focused on, which is suspensions, you know, potential expulsions. This is about uh, removing not the um, the core right to an education. It's um, connected to literally what it says, extracurricular pieces. So uh, we could definitely talk in detail, but I think the reason it calls it out as separate is the law is different as it relates to you can't be educated in school versus you can't play in X game, and there's different standards for those. So I think that's why it, it does seem a bit odd, I know, but I think the law is dictating that it puts the highest premium on the right to an education and a slightly less stringent group of standards on things that don't involve the loss of the right to be educated in the school setting. Okay. I mean, I actually think that, that it is interesting how that is definitely, that, that, that paragraph is definitely more of a blunt instrument than the, other, than the other paragraphs. And so it also sort of begged the question of, uh, you know, how do you balance giving the appropriate authority to the principal to be able to act when they feel the need to act versus... Um, is there any right of recourse? I mean, what do you do if that occurs? Is there any other process that governs this? And, and the funny thing is the, the language at the beginning, um, I mean this in a loving way, sort of weasels around in a vague way that sort of to my, to my bureaucratic eye, you know, suggests lots of process that, that the document's silent as to what the process is, but it implies a process. This is one of those areas where it doesn't. It actually is a very blunt instrument. So I don't want to belabor it though, because I think it's I think this is something that could be taken up later. But it is it is an interesting topic, especially in the context where we have so much discussion around whether or not disciplinary decisions are made in a way that's transparent and fair and you know neutral regarding uh, any element of the background of the students and the family and that kind. Of, you know what I mean? Those kinds of questions come up all the time that you want to know that you can you can find ways of describing how that kind of any kind of discipline like that is approached in a way that's really genuinely accountable, but not accountable, and again, with its layering on additional bureaucracy, but just how would you explain it to a third-party person that this is, occurs in a very fair way? Um, anything else? So otherwise, we'll move on to this, knowing that this is the first reading. We are, yeah, um, I wonder if it's worth checking in. He might have taken a break, but... Um, with our Amherst Media friend, because I think they're still under the system where Oh! Hey, do you, do you all need to change your mm -hmm. hard drive or whatever it is? Yeah, we might as well take a break. Okay, so we will take, <laughs> if, without objection, we'll take a five minute break. So we'll call, the, call the meeting to order again. Uh, the next item on the agenda uh, is the uh, summative evaluation um, for the uh, 
superintendent. Um, there's proposed motion. There's also uh, a memo that's been included um, that uh, I hope uh, does a decent job of summarizing not only sort of the, the, what do you call it, the dispersion of different responses on the survey, but also um, I tried to do something that we've talked about doing in the past, um, which is ensuring that there's a characterization of the kind of range of comments that were provided uh, in the um, in people's evaluations. And with, the, with the awareness, of course, that all of the evaluations that are submitted um, are uh, will be reviewed by the superintendent and uh, make a public documents. So um, is there any, uh, I'll do anything, I guess, we want, should we talk about this a little bit? I know it's a public document. Do you have any comments? Do you have a motion or anything? Sure, no. I mean, without belaboring all the details of yeah. our individual evaluations, I mean, I just want to say I really appreciate the work the superintendent's done this year. I think, uh, I've probably said this at other committees, but I, I think our our particular neck of the woods is, a, is, is a, a challenging place to be for a superintendent. I think we have a number of, of challenging intersections, um, but I, I feel like for the most part, a superintendent rises to that occasion that, he, that he's an excellent fit for for our particular style of play in Amherst, mm -hmm. which is often loud and <laughs> demanding. Um, but, you know, the, the positive side of that coin is that we're always looking to improve. And um, we, we have a, a lot of fiscal capital challenges, as we've heard throughout the evening, uh, you know, going forward. And so to maintain our values within those constraints is very difficult. And um, I just really appreciate the way the superintendent goes about accomplishing that balance. So I think what I want to do is I want to start at one, one end. Um, which is going to be awkward because it'll be then past Peter and then over Peter. Um, and uh, just have, go around if anyone has anything they want to say about their the evaluation at all, uh, then I would welcome hearing it because then after that, if we've exhausted that discussion, then we'll move to a motion. Serena? I've been impressed by the equanimity you approach chaos. Uh, <laughs> a problem is presented, you say, let me think about it, you come back with a decent response. I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Yeah. Solomon? Yeah, I just want to thank you for the year and that it went as smoothly as it did and appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. I'll echo all of those um, sentiments and then I, I think I would just like to say that I think we're um, lucky to be at a point in time where we're being less reactionary and more proactive in planning and so I think um, we hopefully are really laying the groundwork where um, if we do end up carrying out all of the planning that has been a lot of, I think, the meat of what we've been doing this year, and I'm saying we don't really be, but I mean really led by you, um, and also um, the committee. But anyways, um, I just think we're laying the groundwork for really significant progress and a lot of goals, and I'm hoping that we can continue to move in that positive um, direction. So thank you. And I, I agree very strongly with what everyone just said, but Ms. Pitcher just said in particular. And I would, I would say, I'd echo something I said at the Amherst Committee, and kind of something I've said previously in your earlier evaluations, is that I, I like the approach and sort of uh, the method you take to engaging the job, engaging um, diverse stakeholders, being collaborative, um, learning, learning um, through you know, evidence-based uh, research, but also just as importantly, and I think ultimately more importantly, frankly, uh, the engagement with uh, your staff and the stakeholders around you. Uh, and what I appreciate is that I feel like I've seen you grow. It's only been a couple of years, a few years, but I've already seen you grow. And what gives me confidence around where we're going is um, something I said earlier, that if I felt like if I felt like you were peaking and that your method was uh, that, you know, you'd go home from tonight's meeting and you'd say to your family, it's like, this is pretty great. I feel like I've arrived. And like a portion of your brain would shut off that would continue <laughs> to process and grow and learn. Then I'd be like, well, we've really screwed up because we should have been much meaner. And then he would be, he would be like, oh, well, I've got to continue to learn and grow. Um, but since that is your mode, and I've, I've seen, you know, I've said this before, but I'm saying because that is your mode, I think also, because something Mr. Demling said a moment ago, it fits our district and our communities that it, the moment you stop 
accepting a challenge from like a department head in one of the schools who says, I think there's a better way we could do this. At the moment you stop listening to a parent who says, I have like an orthogonal viewpoint that you hadn't thought of before um, that you got to suddenly turn over in your head, right? At the point you're, you're no longer going to fit the community, right? Because the great thing about this community, uh, this set of communities we have, is that we're always going to be challenging you, right? Uh, and that should make the job exciting because creating a great school system and maintaining a great school system out of that melange and making it really equal and wonderful for everyone um, it, you know, is, is a really wonderful challenge, I think, for any professional to be given. Um, so I'll stop there because it's all sort of sort of in there. But my point is, what I want, what I want is what the combination was just said is more onward and upward. And I think next year can be even better, and we can even lay a stronger foundation for what we have. Um, I guess the perils of going second second to last is that everything's been said. So I don't really have much to add, but I want to reiterate and kind of echo the comments that I made at, at an earlier committee meeting, which is. Um, you know, none of us has all of the answers, and um, I think, you know, and tonight is, is a great example, I think, of what I've really appreciated and see in your leadership, um, sort of the collaborative work style with all stakeholders, community, parents, staff, us, um, and taking both criticism, but being able to still lead with a vision um, and, and make things happen. And so I share the enthusiasm from Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Nakajima about sort of what that means for the future and, and um, the big issues that we, we're going to be tackling in the year ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Um, sure. Um, I haven't been here for a few years. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's very important to place Superintendent Morris's tenure in context, and I think it's important to recognize that he um, became superintendent at a particularly difficult time for the district and has managed to navigate through that and to bring some peace, I think, peace and tranquility to some degree, uh, bumps in the road notwithstanding. Um, and I think that's a measure of um, not just his, um, his qualifications as superintendent, but his qualifications as a human being. Um, and I, I don't know if, I don't think anyone was on the committee back then as to how difficult that time was. And um, I, for one, really appreciate Michael, Michael's willingness to take the helm um, and, and guide the, the ship, so to speak. Those are lousy metaphors. But. The one concern that I do have, and maybe it's also a little bit of history here, is I was surprised to see some of the uh, a couple of the uh, items on the, the page with the bullets. Um, I don't think we spend enough time considering how difficult it is to um, attract professional educators of color to Amherst. It's extraordinarily difficult and has been for decades. And I think the fact that we now have a um, African American principal here at the high school is an extraordinary accomplishment, um, and we certainly need to keep doing that. Um, but I, 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 I would hope that the committee would spend some time again looking at history and recognizing how difficult it is. Um, that doesn't excuse not doing it. Don't misunderstand me but I think there are some challenges involved that you need to understand. The second one that I um, was really surprised with was the wellness goal. Um, it's my understanding that um, there has been a significant increase in the awareness of social and emotional problems that kids are bringing to the table these days and that there have been a couple of initiatives that have begun, uh, actually have already started I think a couple of years ago to address the concerns of kids who are um, at risk, um, whether it's for suicide, cutting, or drug abuse, or what have you. I understand there's also a program coming into the middle school next year to address those kinds of issues. And I think that that's, um, that's a new issue that's confronting us as parents and as adults. Um, and it takes some getting awareness uh, and understanding of the the depths of the problem and the vulnerability of a growing sector of youngsters out there in our community. I don't mean to be alarmist, but I think we have to be realistic. 
and um, there are a lot of vulnerable kids out there. And I think this, the, the, the initiatives that you've taken at the high school and will be taking at the middle school, I know that's not part of this, um, uh, really um, are exemplary. And um, I'd be curious to see what the results of those programs are as we go forward. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Terrific. So are there any additional comments or I'd welcome a motion? So moved. I want to read the motion. I'm sorry. I want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Um, um, I move to approve the 2018-2019 evaluation for Superintendent Michael Morris as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is any further comment on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand. Uh, is there any nays? Any abstentions? One abstention. So it carries one, two, three, I'm doing this again. Six, six, zero, one. And it's approved. And so Dr. Morris, do you have anything you want to? Yeah, uh, I'll be brief. I know it's getting late and, um, and we still have more things on the agenda, but um, uh, I joked about this in Amherst and uh, I think I have similar, at the Amherst School Committee, I have similar comments here, which is, you know, a deep appreciation for the, um, the feedback, both the uh, complimentary feedback, but also the critical feedback as well. Uh, and I look forward this week to looking at the individual evaluations. I try to, I don't know why, but my habit is to not do that uh, before the vote and then go back and take a look at the individual evaluations um, that were completed after that, that oftentimes you, you can see the diversity of viewpoints even in the scatter plots here. Um, and I, I think uh, I want to again uh, thank the committee for their support. Um, it took a bit off a lot this year, right? So if we think about uh, just looking at the math, you know, I just had the pleasure of uh, getting to witness some of the professional development that occurred over the last week about the implementation of new math curriculums in grades um, 6 through 12, and I'll say 7 through 12 for this purpose, and just um, that there was ongoing dialogue and feedback that we were receiving both from the community but also from the committee uh, really facilitated a process where we could make pretty significant shifts in our programming um, in a pretty condensed time frame. So I think that's just a very tangible example of um, how in my role and then with, with uh, kind of leadership staff that you get to interact with quite frequently. And the committee, we're able to shepherd the community along to make changes that are in, uh, for the benefit of our students, and particularly in that case, all students, but uh, focus on the opportunity gaps that we see in our district. So I want to thank the committees and, and just um, without going too deep into it, something I'm sorry for the folks who have heard this before, but. You know, I think one of my goals, people talk to uh, Ms. Spitzer and others talk about planning and the planning that's happened, and, and one of the things that I'm actively working on is how to be more um, present to observe the ongoing work of principals uh, in my supervision work with them and also district directors, but particularly principals, frankly. You know, one of the pieces of feedback in the 360-degree survey that, um, that I struggled with in a positive way, by struggled, I mean, you know, it's forced me to think about things critically. Uh, was that there was a pretty significant delta. There was a question that was loose. I don't remember the exact text, but is accessible and responsive, and that was rated you know, higher than, you know, is with me to observe practice. And, and I think that's an accurate reflection. I appreciate that the staff I work with closely can be candid about that, you know, one was significantly, you know, rated higher than the other because that's how, in my reflections, I experience things as well. And so in the next couple of weeks even, probably not even until the next school year, you Please be on the lookout for you know an email from me just to how I want to structure things slightly differently for my time next year because planning is great but implementation is actually a harder work. Um, speaking to a chair who's a planner, so I want to be cautious. But um, I think you'd agree with me that you know you can have great plans and if the implementation um, is not in place and there's not checks and balances and, and to use that acronym I said taps totally accountable people who are being held accountable. The whole thing doesn't work. Um, it ends up being, you know, exciting things on a piece of paper, not influencing all of why all of us are doing our work, which is um, to benefit our students. So, um, I will. I am actively thinking about how to um, shift some of my work and and make sure that I can be uh, as present to make sure that the plans that you've seen and that we'll continue to, to talk about the strategic planning are implemented in ways that that are effective in. Um, to use Mr. Francis, I think, phrasing the outcomes that we want for our students. Um, so uh, thank you for this feedback and uh, being partnering with me on this process, and I look forward to doing it again and better. Great. Okay. Uh, so we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, oh, and I should say, um, <clears throat> 
So I guess we've done it again, right? This is the last meeting of the year, which means we're not going to pick up superintendent goals until August, right? Do you think we can, what do you, how do you want to, um, if you don't mind me asking mm -hmm. this question, slightly ad hoc, um, are you going to come in with goals then, or are you going to want to have a conversation about it, or, or what? I mean, I don't really feel comfortable totally doing that at a retreat, which right. isn't really a public meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, we don't anticipate tons of people showing up at a retreat. Yeah. So what I was thinking was coming up with some loose draft goals based on the feedback and all the individual as well as the collective evaluations. Okay. And coming with that in August for feedback, I think if individual members, um, particularly I'm, I'm cognizant that, you know, we have two members, one who's present and one who isn't, who are not members of the full committee last year. Yeah. So I think as people have thoughts about um, next year, please feel free to share them with me individually. Um, sometimes people might share things a little differently if it's in a formal evaluation document versus yeah. a less formal conversation. Um, you know, email's fine, but I actually tend to like two-way dialogue on that topic, and um, I think that also can inform uh, what I would bring in August. Okay. Does the committee feel comfortable with that? I feel comfortable with that. I mean, I think, I, and also, again, the we talked earlier about the idea that we wanted to actually try to move the process up right. so that we weren't constantly approving goals in, like, November. Right. Uh, and so I think this is a way of doing that. And hopefully you've heard enough from us, and you also have you have a strategic plan. I mean, it's this sort of a known body. We have athletic fields we want to improve. I mean, it's sort of a known body of things we're wrestling with, wellness. That's right. Maybe the next step is in wellness. Yeah. All right. Cool. Excellent. And now, we, now we'll move on. Um, discussion and potential vote on statement regarding lead testing and drinking water and related <coughs> litigation. So um, I think Superintendent will, will, will uh, sort of guide some of the discussion here. But in essence, I mean, we're, this is the last meeting we have prior to the end of August. And um, as I think people are aware, uh, this, this question of ongoing litigation has come up in the newspapers. The reporters have occasionally been interested in it. And, and we, we have not, I think as a committee, been organized to be able to offer an or, a, a, resp a thorough response um, that allows, this is my opinion, anyways, allows us to be on record with the media and other interested parties around um, what the position of the committee and the district is around um, our record on the question of safety of our water in regards to lead. Uh, and so um, we felt it was important to, to at least bring to the committee's attention so that over the next couple of months, uh, if there are inquiries in media, we're able to be able to um, offer a statement with the knowing, with the knowledge that the committee is in fact stood behind what's being said. You know what I mean? What I'm getting? Yeah. Anyway, so do you have anything you want to add? Um, I think actually you captured a lot of what I would have planned to say. Um, I think the particular, um, and I'm happy to say it's in public because it's been reflected in, sure. in the press reporting. Is I've I've not. Um, as someone who gets has gone, been contacted by the media multiple times on this particular issue, um, I have not made a public statement um, that's any different than any other prior statement in, in a very long time, in the magnitude of months, not in the magnitude of weeks. Um, and so I think just having a statement on the record of what the body uh, believes uh, would allow for, you know, there to be a response that's different than what's been shared in the past, which was pretty minimal. That was basically two, two or three sentences, I believe. So. Well, a nice minor question on words on the, the letter. Um, yeah. In the last paragraph on the first page, it says the school committee then retested the water outlets, uh, and then the school committee repeated these steps. Is, it, is there a technical reason why we're saying the school committee? I mean, obviously, these individuals didn't go around and do that work. It's Yes, we oversee it, but, you know, as I didn't know if, what the thinking there was. Yeah, please. I could guess, which is, I think, um, the actions that were taken were in the, um, I'm trying to think of the, the right language for it, I apologize. Um, any actions that we take are in the spirit and the guidance of the school committee. We had discussions um, throughout that period, including a presentation by you know, myself, but also other experts. And so I think the language 
likely comes from that, that it's, it's all on behalf of the school committee as, as the board that governs the district. But I'm not wed to that. I mean, yeah, I mean, it could be. All, I think. I think. I'll be. I'll be honest with you. I think we got some. We got some guidance from our, our attorney on how to write it. And my guess is because uh, the defendant in the case is the school committee. There was an, an intent to declaratively state that the school committee was supportive of all the essentially directed or supported all these actions under the leadership of the superintendent. Um, that's it's inter it's interesting because having 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 gone through this thing. Um, I, uh, I hadn't picked up on that on that point, which is a good one. But I, but I think that's really the key thing: is there to declaratively say that there isn't any there isn't any distance between the superintendent's actions and the school committee's actions in this matter. Gentlemen. Other than that, I would like to say that I think it's a very strong letter. I fully endorse the phrase Mr. Houston's claims are demonstrably false. I think it does an excellent job of detailing the evidence, um, what the federal and state action levels were what the response from the EPA was, um, and I think, I think it's very informative on that on that front. Great, thank you. I, I mean, I think one of the key things about it is that you can't. There's no point in making a statement unless you, you unless you go through the evidence and you go through the action steps, including future ones that we're doing this summer, uh, to even reduce the levels even further. I mean, if you don't say those things, then what's the point, right? You're just saying you're claiming innocence rather than demonstrating it, which I think is the key point. And accountability and responsibility. Uh, okay, so if there's, if there is, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve this statement. So can I ask a procedural question sure. before we do that? Sure. There's a lot of other, um, I'll just say it bluntly, um, heavy information supplemental to this letter included in the packet, and I'm wondering if that is remain to this item or a potential later item? You mean the previous document? Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to understand like what yes. the chair feels about scope of this discussion. Are we just talking about do we approve this letter or not and then we go on? Or are, are we talking about other aspects of what has transpired in this? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll look to tag team with the superintendent on this. Uh, I am comfortable talking about other elements in the previous document with the exception of uh, any discussion that would bleed into litigation strategy because I think you, you, if you get into a question around strategy and what's next uh, in terms of how we'd work with our attorney to respond to things, then we would need to exercise the thing at the end of the agenda of going into executive session. But in terms of a factual recitation of elements, um, that is more than appropriate because they're all public documents. Yeah. I, I'm conscious that I've raised my hand three times in a row, so I want to pause before. Okay, hold on, I'll look around quickly. Mr. Demlin? All right. So um, I, I just wanted just one thing, uh, and this, this is hard for me yeah. uh, because this is about one of our members who's yes. here, um, who I respect. Um, but I feel like it's something I, I want to share because when I became aware of this affidavit in support of the litigation against our committee um, by one of our members. It made I was shocked initially and then just very sad. Um, I, I honestly don't know how to integrate this. Um, you know, I, I feel like when we freely take the oath and swear to represent the regional school district as representatives of the regional school committee, that, that that's what we are sworn to do and that while we all have individual feelings and thoughts about uh, items that we might engage in, which might not always be um, uh, uh, the same as, as what the, the school committee is doing, um, that, that, that's one thing. It's, it's, for me, it feels much differently. And I say feels much differently because I want to be very clear. I'm not trying to claim any illegal activity. I'm not mm -hmm. a lawyer and I'm not saying anything about that. To me, it feels highly ethically inappropriate for individual members of our committee to reference their membership and service on this committee in legal action against this committee. It feels to me ethically impossible to be pursuing one's own action at the same time representing responsibly the interests of the region, which is what we swear to do. And um, it feels to me like a very direct violation of trust, uh, but 
that we all put in each other to represent the committee when we're serving on the committee, um, and, and a violation of, of the community's trust in us that when we are in this role, any information and, and titles and service that we have access to or, or have contributed to is, is in the service of the committee. And um, I, I, I'm not sure how, how to move forward as a committee as, as a result of this. I mean, I, I like the letter, the letter's good, and we'll, we'll figure it out. But um, I, I, I think there needs to be some serious reflection if members feel uh, like their personal action has to go directly against litigation against the committee. You can't be on both sides of the lawsuit, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that's it. It's, it's an unfinished thought, but I just, I just had to share that feeling. Sure. Uh, and by the way, I should say that one of the pieces of advice that, and by the way, there's nothing you just said that would contradict this, um, but one of the best advice that the attorney, or, or district's attorney said was that, that, uh, that we could talk about this item publicly, but we should be mindful of the fact that as a recorded public record, anything that's said at this meeting could further be used um, in, in actually as evidence within the litigation itself, um, which puts a, uh, I'll call you in one second, Mr. Munch, which just simply puts a, um, something to be mindful of as we're talking about this. Mr. Munch. Yeah, I, I haven't been here for this entire controversy, mm -hmm. but I think at this point I would like to move that the continuation of this discussion of the letter uh, be moved into executive session. Okay. Um, we have that on the agenda later, mm -hmm. and so forgive me for saying this, but if, if there is a general sentiment that the committee would like to continue this conversation in executive session, uh, then uh, I would keep it probably on the agenda where it is um, and just move through the rest of the agenda. Um, yes, so uh, let, let me speak in favor of my own motion, please. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I understand and have no quarrel with, with your remarks, sir. Um, if anything, I take them very seriously, given what's in this letter. Um, I, I don't believe that um, a public discussion at this time of this matter is in the best interest of the committee. Um, we need to sort this out as a committee, mm -hmm. and I don't think we should do that in public. Uh, this is a committee matter. It's not a public matter, uh, per se, um, and I think it should be conducted within an executive session. Um, I'm very reluctant to continue myself. I would like to participate in this conversation, but I'm very reluctant to do that in open meeting. Can I ask a question? Do you, do you feel that way about literally the statement is written? Because I recognize that what Mr. D Mr. And I'm not, this is not a critical comment. What Mr. Dimling did is he raised essentially an adjacent topic to the, the actual public statement, and so I'm just curious as to whether you're including both in it. May I? Yeah, I'm um, asking. I was asking you a question, actually. I, I, I think clar characterizing that as an, as an adjacent issue is misleading. Um, the issue is mentioned in this letter, in black and white, so it's not just um, adjacent, it's critical, it's part of the, the very context of this letter. And um, make some statements that um, are very difficult for me to um, process given their severity of, of the discussion. And I, I just would like to do that in, in private. I'll stop there. Mr. Denley? So I totally see where my colleague is coming from and I understand the need for privacy. However, I'm also cognizant that there's very specific and very limited reasons why we can go into executive session and being uncomfortable with potentially negative interpersonal relationships with our colleagues that might make people feel bad and believe me i thought about people's feelings before i said what i said um is not one of those reasons and, and the only and we also have to publish that reason ahead of time and the only reason we have on the executive session is very limited it says we can only go in if we feel like what we're discussing may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the school committee so we have this, this letter, which is a public document, 
Um, so the only reason we could go in there is if we, we thought that that specific reason. You know, we couldn't go in there because we felt like like there was going to be d difficult personal exchange or or, or uh, you know or other matters. I get that. That's my, my feeling. I don't know if others feel different. Yeah, Mr. Ross? yeah I um, I understand what you're saying. Um, I th I believe that um, the information that's contained in the paragraph, the sec next to the last paragraph on page two, is consistent with concerns about making a discussion of the litigation um, that it would have a detrimental effect. Um, I think that's that's part and parcel of what you were speaking to. Um, and I think having a member of the school committee be on both sides of the matter is seriously problematic. Um, and um, I think we need to sort that out in executive session because it is very directly and intricately connected to the litigation. Well, the interesting thing about it is that's actually why I called it an adjacent issue as opposed to a direct one, is that the language in the paragraph was very careful to not actually characterize in any way, except for factually, um, what Mr. Hutstein and the committee member did. Meaning, in other words, it describes what they did. It doesn't actually characterize it in any way, except for to propose a statement to the school committee that we don't believe that uh, the statements as referred to in the, in the letter are accurate. So there's this, there, is a, there is a proposition being offered that the school committee doesn't happen to agree um, with what the committee member and Mr. Hutstein have put forward as their position. It doesn't actually characterize it. So the issue of whether or not people think it's appropriate for a school committee member to do this or not do this is in fact actually in no way addressed in this letter. This letter, is a, this letter is an attempt to propose a statement um, that the committee can agree with or could choose the table, uh, whatever it likes, that we don't actually agree with the substance of the claim uh, that's being proposed by Mr. Hutstein and the committee member. And so that's, that's actually, so to my mind, that's actually, at least in terms of the, the statement, that's actually what's in question, not whether there are any you know, ethical or other concerns about what school committee members should or shouldn't do, which, by the way, I'm not disagreeing. That isn't the right topic for discussion at some point. What I'm saying is that's actually a separate question that's being proposed in the in the statement. I'm going to have Ms. McDonald and Mr. French because you haven't talk and spoken yet. Yeah, um, I, so in thinking about this, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney, so I don't know what the rules are for executive session, but I had this similar reaction as, like, probably isn't something that would be warranted. And even if it were, I do feel in this particular case, as uncomfortable as it may be, I think it's important for us to be transparent and out um, in, in public having this, having this conversation for, it, frankly, just from, this is just my personal opinion, but just be, based on the allegations that are being made in the case itself. So I think a sort of transparency and open conversation on this matter can be helpful for everybody in the community to be witnessing. So I, I for one, um, am in favor of continuing the conversation on this here in open meeting. I do, um, in rereading that paragraph that Mr. Fonch um, specifically pointed out, I, I do generally agree that it's a statement and of what's happen to date with the exception of middle sentence line one two three four five where it says what the school committee is doing the school committee wholly rejects those accusations as improper inaccurate and unfair and so that might be the one issue that whether it, sort of a rephrase of it to sort of bring it back to a pure statement of fact as opposed to um, the school committee's strategy or approach to what's been happening, and I don't have a solution for that, but I, I do think that that might be sort of rephrasing that might bring it closer to a, a, a straight recitation of what's been happening in, in recent weeks or months. But that's... Okay. Mr. Uh, there was no second for my motion, so I will withdraw my motion. And if it's the, um, the um, consideration of um, my colleagues to go ahead and have this discussion if it should occur in public, um, so be it. Okay. Spitzer? 
Can you reference? Yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. Because <laughs> um, this, is, this is, for the reasons people have listed, this is really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I, I hope we will have a conversation in an executive session, and I hope we will also be able to talk about this letter openly. Okay. Um, and I think the things with the letter is, I think if there's any member of the school committee who disagrees with the strongly with the idea that we are, I would like the school committee to be able to state firmly and openly that there is no concern about lead in our school's water, mm -hmm. a, because I think it's it's bringing up an issue that is, as a parent and as somebody who comes here on a regular basis and drinks the water, like it, it's it's fundamental that we have trust in our in our schools, that we are protecting our kids, and if there's ever a finding that we're doing anything wrong, that we do everything in our power to protect them. And I believe, and, and from all my conversations with um, the people in charge who are, who are doing this, and I have trust in them, that our water is safe and mm -hmm. that people should not be worried about it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think because of this litigation and the coverage it's received in the press, there's questions around that issue. And I think we should state this, so I'm in support of this letter, and I'm wondering if, if anything, we should just take out that questionable paragraph and just make it a statement purely about the safety of the water and the measures we have taken to protect our, our kids and anybody who's ever drinking water in the schools. And if that might be even more power, like, I, I think that's, for me, that's the heart of the issue. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm less worried about, you know, I am worried about the personal stuff, but for me, the, the core is that we are protecting our kids and that we have faith in our institutions that are doing this right okay. now. So in other words, in that, in that, in that context, uh, by the way, first off, I completely and utterly agree with you about the point being that we, we, we I, my, I'll say my belief, we've, I've been at all these meetings and I believe we in fact have been focused on the safety of uh, staff, students, parents, members of the community. Uh, one hundred percent. I believe we've been doing that. Um, that's the reason why I make like my opinion that I think that that uh, that on a factual basis, Mr. Osteen's, um case is, is without merit, not because it couldn't be considered well intended in terms of wanting the water to be clean, but in the fact that factually we have in fact been doing the right thing. I also think it's critically important for the public be aware of that. So, I guess this goes to something along the lines of something that Mr. Fontra was saying a moment ago, <laughs> that, you, that, that you could really genuinely make these issues adjacent as opposed to connected if you remove that paragraph and simply say, here's, here's a recitation of, of uh, the, what we consider the facts to be around what we've done and what we're continuing to do around the safety of the schools and the water. And then essentially if, we're, if the committee is interested in dealing with the substance of the litigation and other elements of it, um, we could deal with that separately. That's that's sort of what I'm hearing. He's that's what I'm recommending. Okay, the, I mean, I guess I would. Can we do that in the form of motion. So I move to approve this letter with the removal of the fourth paragraph on page two. Okay, is there a second? Second. Removed and seconded. Is there further discussion of um, that item? I guess what I would say is. I'm act I, I actually am in favor of that motion, mainly because I actually agree with you. We need a really clear statement out there around what we've actually been doing to ensure the safety of, of, of the water, um, and I think throughout. And uh, it doesn't mean we can't talk about other issues at some other point, but l um, let's get that done. So, And I think the issue, the reason why it came up is because, uh, I'm going to be very blunt about this, the reason it came up is because the nature of the additional filing from Mr. Hoodstein was as much a surprise to myself and the superintendent and our attorney as it was to you when you looked at it. And so this was essentially a kitchen sink response, but we don't need to do a kitchen sink response. It's more, it's more than appropriate, on my view, it's more than appropriate to proceed as we want. Did you have anything you wanted to add, superintendent? No. Okay, so any further debate on the, on the motion? The motion, by the way, to be clear, is to approve the, the statement with the removal of, of that said paragraph. So if you vote yes, you're actually approving the letter. Okay, any 
for the discussion, no discussion. All those in favor? Say that again, please. You're approving this statement. Without that paragraph. Without that paragraph. Thank but you. I'm saying it's not like a vote to amend and then we approve. It's one motion. Thank you're you. approving it with the initial elimination of that paragraph. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve the letter with that uh, amend that change signify by raising your hand. Uh, any any opposed? Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. So one, two, three, four, five eyes, uh, and uh, one nay and one abstention. And the mo and it carries. It is approved. Um, thank you. So so actually, what we can do at the end of this meeting is adjourn and enter into executive. Yes, Mr. Fonch. Yeah, I'm just curious. Will the letter now include? The name of the member who was identified in the deleted paragraph. Um, uh, you know, to be honest with you, uh, I hate that I'd like do a motion to reconsider, yeah. but I would actually like to eliminate the names, and it be a statement of the school committee. Because in fact, it's a statement of the school committee. Um, I guess I can move to reconsider something since I am, since I was I was in the affirmative on the motion. Uh, I'm going to move to reconsider the motion. I think that requires actually a second and a second moved in seconded. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor of reconsideration of the motion? Can, can I proceed? Yes. So this is just, do we reconsider it? And then if we reconsider it, then we vote again to approve it again, right? We, yeah, probably with an amendment. Yeah, yeah. Eliminating those names. So this is just, do we reconsider it? Yeah, yeah, all exactly. Right, thank you. So all those in favor of the motion to reconsideration, signify by raising a hand. That carries unanimously. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Uh, so I actually move uh, to further edit the uh, statement with the elimination of the names, uh, and it simply be signed by the Amherst. On the regional school committee. Oh. There are seconds. Move down second. Oh. Uh, so uh, it would be approved again with that change to the signature page and the, again the elimination of said paragraph. So all those in favor of that motion signify by raising your hand. Okay, any nays? Any abstentions? Okay, we have the same vote, uh, but now we've cleaned it up and Mr. Concha, I actually appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you very much. Um, so, as said a second ago, um, we have at the end of our agenda a potential adjournment to executive session. So we're going to currently move to item uh, 7F, which is FY20 schedule and retreat planning. There is an item of business involved in approving the, uh, the calendar. Um, but we also, um, so I guess one question I would have for the committee is we have done retreats the last few years. Uh, I'm assuming we're going to do another one. Is that something that is desired by the committee? I mean, even if it, the formats change or whatever we do with the actual thing, do you want to have one in like uh, August? I'm seeing nodding heads. <laughs> are there any opinions to the contrary, which are perfectly welcome? Can we have one? Mr. Punch. Um. I, I thought of re retreats as an opportunity for a couple of things to happen with any committee. One is it's an opportunity for bonding. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's an opportunity to address matters that we wouldn't normally address at a school committee meeting. Um, that, you know, if there are matters of uh, particular difficulty or importance, um, you know, something of that nature. I, mean, I, I simply would like to know what the agenda is going to be mm -hmm. and what the proposed, what the hoped, hoped for outcomes will be of the retreat. Well, I mean, I, the reality is we're going to, if we choose to do one, we're going to end up uh, brainstorming the agenda. You're, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right in terms of past practice that what we've tended to do is focus on how to improve the performance of the school committee or the school committee and, and the superintendent together. And so we focused on uh, practical, I hate to call them practical, but practical things that we don't have the time to do. Like, um, do we need to improve our orientation for new members? Uh, do we need to improve 
the organize what what are the things we need to do to improve the agenda setting um, not just in any given meeting but sequentially <laughs> what do we need to improve meeting flow so those are the kinds of things we've talked about in the fat in the past and typically we've done that agenda set I mean I've been chair for all the ones I've been participated in so lucky me um, I can actually say that, that we've every time we've done one we've done it by brainstorming with members of the committee both in terms of what we might talk about literally right now but also in follow-up um, with emails that would go to myself and the vice chair um, to basically say here are my thoughts on what we might have and the, me the meeting by the way is of course pu post publicly posted um, so that the public's aware that it's going on and it is an open meeting and I don't want to say it's technically an open meeting if somebody wants to come they can come um, but it is formatted then as a retreat and in particular what that means practically is that, that for example I don't facilitate it I get someone else to facilitate it so that I'm just I mean I, I don't have an odd duck role of choreographing the meetings like I do in these um, also means I get to shut up more often which is a good thing okay. yeah Okay, so uh, so I saw a lot of nodding heads about having one, which is good. Uh, and uh, are there ideas of things you'd like to cover now? And I, I don't want to repeat myself, but I said also there's plenty of opportunity to do so after this fact with emails. Uh, by, by the way, for anyone who wasn't here, uh, Allison was voted vice chair, so she gets the long, short straw, whatever it is, to <laughs> work with me to put this thing together. Um, any ideas? So maybe Astina, the Mr. I don't know if this is an idea, but we talked about um, how do we respond to announcements or student f comments from the community. How mm -hmm. do we respond rather than dead silence? Okay, Spitzer. Um, I'm just thinking about the major change that's going to happen once we have all five seats up for election in the mm -hmm. fall and potentially how that could impact um, transitions as you were just talking about mm -hmm. and it might make sense to talk about that and think proactively about it um, maybe that goes to item eight but it could also be a I think a reasonable topic for a retreat and I would just give feedback on the last retreat I feel I think the nice thing about a retreat is that it may let us like it would kind of be nice to do a little bit of small group work or like writing reflection. I, like it felt a little bit last time like we were kind of sitting in a room, somebody else was taking over your role, but we weren't necessarily talking more to each other mm -hmm. and we weren't necessarily changing things up. And I'm hoping that maybe mm -hmm. we could um, have a chance to either change the way we share feedback, either through writing or conversation or just work in smaller groups on topics mm -hmm. and just use it as an opportunity to change as much sure. as we can. Yeah, I, I sort of have a similar thought about our last retreat, and I think potentially we would probably bid off more than we could chew in the agenda setting. So, like thinking through like what are our real priority topics that we want to address, and really spending the time to dig into them. Um, and I love the idea of sort of small group work and sort of group reflection. But I, I think something where we take fewer topics and sort of. At, consciously prioritize and put take things off the table um, and I, I love I like the idea of figuring out the engaging the, the community during our meetings um, as well as structure going forward and how you know how we can sort of make that less disruptive for the committee going mm -hmm. forward um, the, the two ideas there but yeah I think how we facilitate it and how many topics we try to tackle in that retreat, I think can really make it more productive. Cause I sort of felt like, not sure, not that it wasn't worth it because it was, to your point, the bonding experience sort of getting to know everybody mm -hmm. cause I was new on the committee, but I think that's, it, it was a lot of time for just getting to know each other. And I think it might be helpful if we feel like we could walk out of there with something really solid. Sure. Super. Just my reflection based on Ms. Spitzer and Ms. McDonald's comments um, is that uh, two years ago um, the facilitator did actively break into small groups and the context was different. Every year is different. They're different people. But uh, from my role, I found that really helpful. I think that's a really good suggestion. And it got a little closer to, and not that it was perfect, but a little like there were things on whiteboards that people were working on. Mm -hmm. And it did feel like um, it was collaborative work instead mm -hmm. of um, mostly oral 
dialogue and uh, I think the retreat as opposed to these typical formal school committee meetings perhaps allows for that structure to work so uh, just from my vantage point having gone through three of them three, well actually more than that five of them five or six going back to when I was in a former role um, I, I, I just want to second yeah. or third that notion of can it be an interactive collaborative work session where at the end people go back and there's there's kind of evidence and you know people say like oh we got this done we yeah we worked on this and here's our next steps um i think relying on our old dialogue well can be interesting and bonding it doesn't necessarily have that same feeling yeah that's interesting i mean i think i think that there's there's sort of i like the balance point of one wanting to get things done that we can move forward but also i think changing the nature of how we engage with one another so i think one of the things that i've been mindful of over the last few years is looking for opportunities to ensure that all the members of the committee feel engaged and empowered and sort of flatten any perceived hierarchies in the sense of how we come up with topics, how we talk about things, how we edit them and stuff, how we do the work that we're doing. And I think that's hard to do with nine people. It's hard to do with nine people. So I'll do with hard to do with nine people who come on at different time points and have different levels of familiarity, which is why it's something that I think you have to build in structurally into how you do your work. I mean, you have to build it in somehow. Otherwise, you'll never get there. So can we, let's, um, if it's okay, two things. One, I think um, Deb should send out some kind of a doodle poll for dates to try to find dates as soon as possible before people disappear. I think the second thing is, if the committee is comfortable with this, then um, Ms. McDonald and myself and, and the superintendent can sit down and start thinking about um, structure, but then also thinking about how we could then send out some kind of a survey or some sort of email to the committee to respond to, to, to garner your ideas in a way that allows you to actually have a cup of tea and sit back and think about this, rather than being forced to feel like you're answering on the fly right now. Um, I think we should be able to do that. Okay? Is that all right? Is that When have we done them in the past again? We've done evening. them in the evening. evening. Right? They've been in the evening the last several. Yeah. I've been past this for a year and have been some daytime. Okay. I just wanted some guidance from the committee. I want some guidance from the committee. Early evening. evening. Is there anyone who dissents from keeping with what we've been doing in terms of time? Well, I know you don't. You just said that. <laughs> I, mean, anyway. I prefer evening, but I, I'm retired. I can do 24-7. <laughs> well, that is a challenge. I prefer 24-7 retreat. That is a challenge for all of us. Bring the uh, Deb, why don't we stick with what we have now? Um, I think that'll be good. Okay, and so I need a motion for the calendar. I just have one quick question on the calendar. Sure, of course. Is Tuesday, August 27th, day before school? Yes. Ooh. That is so what uh, is that what does that mean? So that is a problem. Oh, I am sorry. I, I didn't. Yep. Good catch. Cuz I'm thinking about you, not us. Yeah. Well, I mean some of us, but no, no, no. more you. That's spot on. No, we'll we'll correct that. Okay. So, you want to correct it now or are you going to correct it later? I'm not trying to be cute. No, 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 I'm, 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 I think Mr. Corbin's saying. One thing that um, I don't think we did last year, but we've done for a couple of years in a row is have one meeting in August that was the joint Amherst region. I mean, we could certainly, I mean, you could do a different day other than a Tuesday, but um, that's another potential. So the only, the only, well, I mean, I think the thing is that you want to structure those that you, you know that you, you're doing it for a good reason, essentially. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves around what we're going to be doing at that meeting that makes that a good idea or not a good idea. Um, this is gonna, yes. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I was, okay. uh, I was just thinking, uh, the other thing is the first regional meeting, you know, we referred to earlier also, hopefully it can be a Union 26 meeting simply to reorganize. Yeah. Um, but I'm, you know, I think Thursday of that week would be fine, but we could also, I'm open to other ideas. And I really appreciate the catch by Mr. Right, yeah, it's great. There are Thursdays, by the way, something that people look out three months from now, two months from now. No one has any idea. So let's do Thursday, tentatively, because no one can figure out a reason to say no at the moment. <laughs>
uh, which we can then send a seven to a nine, which also seems type of typographically easy to do. Uh, and then I still entertain a motion to approve. I move to accept the schedule of the regional school committee meetings um, as amended. As amended. Um, for the 2019-2020 school year. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further debate? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we have gifts. Where are the gifts? They were given out in the second sheet. Well, I guess if someone else wants to read them, I'm good. Spitzer? Sure. Um, I move to accept the following gifts. Pelham's Lion Club number 1312 2019 High School Scholarship in the amount of $125. Anonymous gift number 56017855600. Arms at the principal's discretion. Ten, amount is ten dollars. Ten dollars. Um, a gift from Donald and Susan Mayo, number seven five two six, Amherst Regional High School girls softball in memory of Donald Gipovich. Apologies for mispronunciations. In the amount of twenty five dollars. A gift from Sharon and David. Wars in the number 5511, Amherst Regional High School girls softball in memory of Donald Gibovich in the amount of $25. A gift from Cynthia Haddock, number 5352, to support the girls' varsity tennis in the amount of $100. A gift from Cynthia Haddock, number 5353, to support girls' junior varsity lacrosse in the amount of $100. A gift from Arms. PGO number 222 to support Environmental Action Club water filling station in the amount of $150. A gift from GoFundMe, Jennifer Wellborn number 2206 to support the Environmental Action Club water filling station in the amount of $1,206.92 for a total amount of $1,741.92. They include yeah, yeah, keep okay. going. Oh, also, um, grants um, from the Amherst Education Foundation, number 1571, to support the second payment of Amherst Regional High School Light Board Performing Arts in the amount of $3,347.50. The Amherst Education Foundation grant number 1571, second payment of Amherst Regional High School Restorative Justice in the amount of $5,000. Amherst uh, Grant from Amherst Education Foundation number 1571 to support the second payment of the coding robotics to middle school eighth grade in the amount of $4,000 for a total grants of $12,347.50. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion of the agenda item? Seeing none, all those in favor <coughs> uh, signify by raising your hand. <coughs> Carries unanimously. Thanks, everyone, for the gifts. Um, the next item on our agenda, they kind of feel like we just did this, the school committee planning. So given the fact that we have a long way to go before our next meeting, I'm going to waive this item or to consider it fulfilled unless somebody objects, no one's objecting. Uh, we'll waive that. Um, and then I, I heard significant sentiment from the committee um, that item nine on the agenda is in fact ripe and salient. Um, so. Uh, I move that we adjourn and enter an executive session pursuant to Mass General Law for 30A, Section 28A, the Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation in Michael Hutstein versus the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, uh, U.S. District Court for the, uh, the District of Massachusetts, case number 317CV30146, because uh, the chair finds that an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the school committee, and we have no intention to return to open session. Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. This is a roll call vote. Uh, we'll begin over here with Ms. Wayne. Manino, aye. Demling, aye. Sullivan, aye. Spitzer, aye. Nakajima, aye. McDonald, aye. Fonch, aye. Okay, we are in executive session. Thank you, Amherst Media.